Hi, my CGIU family. Hello from Austria. I come from Mexico. And I'm from Chicago, Illinois. And I'm speaking to you today from sunny Wales. And I'm a student at Noor University in Buda, Norway. I'm currently based in Hyderabad in India. I'm from Germany and I live in the UK and Scotland. And I'm from Fortaleza, Brazil. Unfortunately, I am a commitment maker in the 2020 cohort of the Clinton Global Initiative University. Before we start, I am in my leopard onesie because I am currently in self-isolation. I want to hope that you are all keeping well and healthy and safe in isolation as well. My commitment to action. My commitment to action. My commitment to action. Simple solutions to replace traditional fuel sources in schools and communities in Western Kenya. Here in Zimbabwe, about 1.3 million people are living with HIV. As an Arab American, I'm personally vested in the global refugee crisis, especially given how it's affected the Middle Eastern region. I'm a medical student from Romania, and I'm really passionate about disaster medicine. So my commitment to action is to work with legal aid organizations in cities and rural areas that are most impacted by the opioid crisis in America. While this is a time where we need to be socially distant from one another, I have never felt more globally connected. People are being impacted by this pandemic in different ways, but ultimately we are all going through this together. As a medical student, I can say that the impact of COVID-19 is huge, both physically and mentally. As never before, in the last decades, we need solidarity from global leaders and experts. A lot of youths around are doing their best to make sure they don't spread the virus, they're staying in their houses, they're washing their hands and using hand sanitizers. These times have shown that we need the arts to express ourselves, to relate to others, to confront or to distract. We are leading virtual mini ballet and books sessions to help expose our children and keep them engaged in dance and literacy programming. But most importantly, it affects me because I work in elderly care. So I have to ensure every time I go that I'm not inadvertently bringing the disease to these people who I'm supposed to care for. It's in the last week in the UK, over 600,000 people have volunteered. This sends a very clear message of the capacity for human kindness that already exists in our society and what it can achieve at scale. Just hoping that we can persevere and that we'll all come out uh, through this COVID-19 outbreak uh, stronger than ever and I can't wait to connect with everyone again in the future. And that once we are able to transition back to normal ways of life, we were able to have more compassion and care for one another. It's been an honor to be part of this movement and to see the community work together to help create a better world. I'm doing my bit to spread sunshine during these times of darkness and I hope you are too. I know that by working together we can create change and we can overcome this. Changing the world for the better isn't just someone else's business, it's really up to all of us. Every young person needs to make a commitment that in the 21st century, the definition of citizenship requires us all to do this kind of work. Please welcome William Jefferson Clinton, founder and board chair of the Clinton Foundation and 42nd President of the United States, and Chelsea Clinton, vice chair of the Clinton Foundation. Hello, and thanks for joining us for this virtual CGIU. We're driving action around the COVID-19 epidemic, and I hope that wherever you're turning in, you, your family, and loved ones are staying safe. Like all of you, I've been looking forward to this weekend and being at the University of Edinburgh. I can't thank them enough for all their support, and I am delighted to say that we're still going to Edinburgh just a year later. Next year, CGIU will be there April 9th through April 12th, 11th. Even though we can't be together in person today, we're going to do some good things. CGI has never been about what we can't do. It's been about what we can do. And now, of course, we're being challenged in a new and very different way. I know these last few weeks and months have been hard for everyone, including college and university students, campuses shut down, classes put online, 
your lives, routines upended. And many of you prepared to graduate into an uncertain job market and without a formal graduation ceremony. I think it's a great a credit to you that in the middle of all this, you want to do CGI. And I also think it's a good decision. I'm excited about the program we put together today. I hope the broad range of participants will give you some new insights about not only where we are now, but about things you might be able to do to help. First of all, the struggle you're in is foremost a public health battle. It's being waged at local, state, and national levels all around the world. And some countries are also deeply involved in cooperation with international institutions like the World Health Organization. We can't get back to normal until we've got control of this virus and we can keep it under control. And that may take longer than we wish. It's already taken longer than we wish. But there are a lot of moving parts, a lot of complicating factors, including in the United States, the very significant racial disparities and income disparities in exposure to the virus and in its mortality rate. So we have to deal with all these things. We've got new challenges. We have to implement quality and remote learning. We've got to ensure students affected by school closures can continue to access essentials like meals, housing, and the internet. My presidential library in Arkansas has now served well over 100,000 meals to school students who aren't in school anymore, to the homeless population, to elderly people living alone, and other vulnerable groups. And there are all kinds of things that we normally don't think about in combating an epidemic that because of our response and the need for social distancing and quarantines, we've had to deal with now. Food supply has become a major emergency and paying for food is what many people said today is the first thing they would do in the United States when they got their relief check from the government. Now, there are a lot of other things that we'll talk about today, things that our foundation has been privileged to work on, things that happened in the past that may or may not be relevant. What about what we did with cholera? What about what we did with Ebola? What about what we did with AIDS? And things that we can't answer for you today, for sure. When can or should we get back to a more normal kind of activity? But I want you to keep asking yourselves what questions do you still want answered and what can you do to make it better? Because if there is anything we will learn out of this epidemic and fighting it, is that we're still in an interdependent world we can't escape each other. And networks of positive cooperation work better than positive conflict or people just going off on their own to fight an enemy that knows no geographic or physical boundaries. So thanks for being here. I hope you enjoy it. And now I'd like to turn it over to Chelsea. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Uh, welcome wherever you are in the world uh, joining us for our first ever virtual CGI University. Uh, while we're all so uh, sad that we're not together in person, we're all incredibly grateful that you are joining us uh, virtually today. And uh, I hope that I can speak for all of us to say how profoundly grateful we are to all of our uh, frontline health workers and frontline workers uh, in the United States, uh, in Edinburgh, where we had hoped uh, to be together and really all over the world, uh, including uh, some of our uh, CGIU alums like uh, Jonathan Chan uh, from CGIU class of 2011 uh, and so many others. Uh, I also 
I just want to say how grateful we are to Adriana Schneider, Maria Luisa Popescu, and Sam Warrock from the CGIU classes of 2017, 2010, and 2016, respectively, uh, for all the work they're doing to create a, a robust, flexible, and uh, useful um, online platform for um, everyone who's affected uh, by COVID-19 to kind of share uh, what they're learning uh, with one another and hopefully to learn together. As I think we've seen in the last uh, weeks and months, um, this has been a very grim uh, moment uh, for our world and yet also one of just extraordinary uh, ingenuity uh, and, and resilience. And so I hope that we'll be able to talk about kind of why uh, some of this is so grim, but also kind of what is happening uh, to hopefully help us uh, respond effectively uh, and to ensure that um, the responses of today become the resilience of tomorrow. So again, just thank you all for joining us. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to our conversations uh, here today. And I hope as ever, you'll let us know at CGIU what we can be doing to help you um, in your commitments and in your responses to uh, COVID-19 in the uh, days uh, and weeks, months ahead. Thank you. Now a message from Peter Mathieson, Principal and Vice Chancellor at the University of Edinburgh. Hi, I'm Peter Mathieson, the Principal of the University of Edinburgh, and I just want to send my very best wishes to everybody attending the Clinton Global Initiative University in 2020, which I know is taking place remotely. If things had gone according to plan, I would have been welcoming you here to the historic city of Edinburgh for the 2020 CGIU. However, the coronavirus pandemic made it inevitable that the event had to be postponed, and I look forward to welcoming CGIU to Edinburgh in 2021. The city of Edinburgh has so much to offer. We have two World Heritage Sites. We have the New Town, which is a mere 250 years old, and the Old Town, which is considerably older, some of it dating back to the Middle Ages. We have a fabulous castle, we have beautiful hills to climb, lovely countryside around, and lots of historic heritage buildings. The University of Edinburgh itself is 437 years old and prides itself on its international credentials. We have a community of international scholars from all over the world, students and staff, numbering 55,000 in total, waiting to welcome you to Edinburgh next year. I'm sure the remote event will be a great success and I know that some Edinburgh academics who are working on coronavirus 19 will be contributing to the discussions along with President Clinton and Chelsea Clinton. I wish you all the very best for the conference and I look forward to catching up with you here in Edinburgh, a year delayed but nevertheless we think we've got a great deal to offer uh, visitors to our beautiful city, the capital of Scotland. All the very best to you. William Jefferson Clinton, founder and board chair of the Clinton Foundation and 42nd President of the United States. And Andrew Cuomo, Governor of New York. Thank you. Uh, Governor Cuomo, as you know, you're talking to uh, about 800 students from almost 100 countries. Uh, from many from the United States going to university here, but many from around the world who, like a lot of our people, have been dislocated. Some of them are at the beginning of their epidemic, some in the middle, some hopefully at the end. I think everyone who's followed this on the media has been profoundly impressed by the leadership that you have exhibited, both mostly by just getting on top of it and working through the problems and telling people exactly what the facts were if you understood them. So since I think it's clear this is the severest test of your leadership or that of any other governor in a very long time, in your life, in your career, what do you think has best prepared you for this? Well, Mr. President, first, uh, I can't tell you what a welcome sight it is to see you. Uh, these have been some long, long days and long nights. I know you can appreciate it. Uh, and uh, you have been such an important influence in my life, and you've taught me so much. 
Uh, and uh, you taught this nation so much. It's just real personal pleasure to be with you. Uh, what has prepared me for this? I don't think anything can prepare you for this. How do you prepare to deal with 700 deaths every day, right? Uh, how do you deal, how do you, how are you prepared for the pain of it, the, the human suffering of it? Uh, it's taken a, it's very hard for me still to deal with it. So uh, I don't know that anything could prepare me or that I was prepared or that I want to be prepared to deal with this level of pain and suffering. Uh, but you put that aside, uh, for people who believe in government, who believe in public service, who got into this in the first place because they believed they could make a difference and believed government was a vehicle to make a difference, uh, it's the ultimate challenge, right? Government will make a difference literally as to whether people live or die. It's, it's that clear and it's that intense. And it's not about government, whether or not government would like to do it, whether it, uh, there's a government need as determined by the people and the political process. It's clear. It's a government need, and it has to perform, and it has to perform well, and it's about capacity and competence uh, and making a difference in this moment. And on that level, I've been preparing all my life. I believed public service was a vehicle to make a difference. I believed that in my 20s. I was involved with not-for-profits and causes, and I was helping the homeless in my 20s. But uh, my father was governor, and uh, he left me with a legacy of government is actually a vehicle to make large-scale change quickly. You can do a lot of good in a lot of places in life, but government can actually make a, a large difference uh, quickly when done well. And then I learned the art form of making government work. Uh, my father and you were my two big teachers, both governors. Uh, and as a governor, I didn't understand it at the time, but as a governor, you must make the process work. You must make the machine operate. You have to get the legislation passed to make a difference. You have to have the agencies function to make a difference. And there's a practicality to being a governor that, frankly, a legislative position or some other positions don't, don't have that same orientation. So you gave me a respect for the, the uh, occupation of uh, public service as a government official, as a manager, uh, as a leader. You have to be a communicator. You have to be capable of managing a government. This this moment in time brings all that together under this intense pressure. But uh, it's, it's everything you taught me, it's everything my father taught me, uh, just at a level that I never thought uh, anyone would ever ask anyone else to perform at. Well, let me ask you something. One of the things that I've heard you talk about a lot in your daily briefings and that I am painfully familiar with because of the work my foundation does around the world, as well as in American states with some of our projects, and especially trying to feed poor children and homeless people uh, around our library in Arkansas. But one of the things that it really has bothered you is this competition among the states for vital equipment which has bothered a lot of smaller states even more because they feel like they're losing a bidding war. And then you were talking about the competition even within New York among the big hospitals. And without a published list of what supplies are available every day um, and without some sort of buyers consortium, it's been tough to deal with that. So the reason I'm asking this question partly is because these other states in America have a long way to go, and there are countries represented by people on this phone call who are just about to face this. So what's your advice on this? How should we avoid what would normally be healthy competition, which doesn't make a lick of sense when you're short of life-saving material, when you're trying to develop medicines that at least might keep people alive, even if they won't cure people? Why is this the wrong thing to do, just letting the 
competitive juices run and what should we be doing? Uh, you know, I've been, uh, as I've been working through this, I have to work with a lot of governmental partners. Federal relationship is very important, as you know. Uh, so uh, everyone's been working well together. But when they do the retrospective on this, and I've said it uh, during the process of it, the federal government had a different role than they have played here, right? I mean, uh, we did, thanks to you, uh, you had the best emergency management operation I think that the federal government ever had. But I was the HUD secretary. I worked with FEMA. We did all these situations together. We did the Midwest floods, the Los Angeles earthquakes, uh, Hurricane Andrew down in Florida. You had me go to other countries to help on the rebuilding. That federal role is so important. This was a federally declared disaster. This was not a New York State declared disaster or a California disaster. It was a federally declared disaster. Uh, where was the federal government stepping in? Where was FEMA as the main entity managing this for the nation? You're exactly right. We got into the situation where every state had to manage a federal disaster. How does that happen? And we're all trying to buy the same materials. Everybody needs masks, gowns, and ventilators. So it was like being on eBay internationally, competing against every other state and competing against the federal government to buy the equipment. Uh, and if you're a smaller state, uh, New York could outbid you, and California could outbid you, and Illinois could outbid you. Uh, but it should have never happened that way. We're going to have the same situation on testing. You watch. We, these private sector companies do testing. No one has the scale or the volume that we need. You can't buy the swabs. You can't buy the vials. You don't have the uh, manufacturing equipment. So you're going to have another situation of 50 states all competing, trying to buy the testing. I've been saying uh, today, the federal government has to take over testing uh, and let them figure out how to bring it to scale. But you know, every level of government should do what it does best in that situation. And when you have a national emergency and it's a, state a nationwide situation, the federal government to me is still the key player, right? When we would go in with a regional uh, emergency Federal government was the main player, and you organized the states under you, uh, and you deployed resources as the federal leader. That's what should be happening here. Well, do you believe it that I noticed, uh, I saw you put up a tweet once saying maybe the states themselves could set up some sort of buying consortium and uh, have a purchasing and, and price bargaining agent for all the states. you still think that's possible? In this, conceptually, yes. In this time frame, I don't think so. Because look, it's a, it would have to be a consortium that literally spends billions of dollars uh, and gets organized and delivers the product in 10 days, right? I need testing now uh, of, a, of a scale never imagined. And I need that testing capacity tomorrow. Uh, New York, for example, since this started, we performed 500,000 tests, okay? Let's call it a month. 500,000 tests in a month. That's more than any state in the United States has done. That's more than the next three states combined have done. 500,000 tests sounds like a lot of tests until you remember this is a state with 19 million people. Uh, and that was one month to do 500,000 tests. And that was before the competition of all the other states kicks in. Uh, and now all those other states are going to be buying the same capacity that I have been buying. So uh, to get that up and organized quickly, I don't think you can, you can set up another entity. I think the federal government could come in do the purchasing, do the acquisition, figure out these supply chain issues. I'm working with these private sector testing companies that need to get supplies from China. What do I know to help them to get supplies from China? You know, it's not, not what I do. 
It's what the federal government does. And that's that's the role they should be playing. First of all, I, let's play this test thing out a little more. I saw that you and the governors of several other nearby states have announced a joint plan for how you will go about determining how to start the economy up again without risking people's health. Do you think that this group of states can purchase anything together and maybe speed up the supplies necessary for you to isolate people who are positive and need to be given care and taken out of the economy? Well, it's interesting. I have a consortium, if you will, of my region, my neighboring states. So about seven states, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Connecticut, Delaware, Rhode Island. Uh, and we're all working together, Connecticut. We're working together. And we're doing, in essence, what the federal government could have been doing on a, on a smaller scale. Uh, first, the curve of this disease hits different places uh, at different times. So I've been saying, let's follow the path of the curve from place to place. In other words, New York had the first curve. New Jersey is going to have the worst of it in about eight, nine days, they say. Connecticut is after that. So why don't I send my medical equipment, because I'm now on the way down, I take my material and personnel and I help New Jersey. And then we both go help Connecticut. We're doing that. Uh, that could have been better organized, frankly. And that's going to happen right across the country. Florida has a different timetable. Texas has a different timetable. Uh, once you staffed up and had the equipment to handle one high curve, and New York was the high curve and the first curve, if you can handle the New York curve, you can almost handle any other curve, right? Our numbers are so much higher than any other place. Help me, and then I'll send all my medical equipment and personnel, and we'll help you a week later and a week later and a week later. Um, I'm, we're doing that within our consortium. Could have been done on a federal level. Uh, in terms of the testing, it's the same thing. We're going to be trying with our cooperative effort to pool our laboratories, pool our health capacity. We need tracing agents in the hundreds and hundreds of people, right? You take the test and then you trace back all the contacts. It's never been done on this scale before. This is an army of tracers, they're basically investigators. Uh, we will do that the best we can on, with, these, uh, with this seven state consortium. But it could have been done from the federal government on a much tighter, more efficient basis. Well, it may not be too late on this one. I, uh, you know, I agree with you on this. This contact tracing is very important, and it could enable our entire country for the first time to have a real public health system, a real public health core. And uh, I've thought about it in a lot of different ways. Could we? Could we make this a part of AmeriCorps and encourage people to come and do this work and earn some credits to go to college, for example? Um, is there some other way we could do it? But I, I know that uh, my friend, uh, whom you know well, Paul Farmer, uh, is heading up a program for Massachusetts now to try to get a state contact tracing core. But you've got to get all those bodies in there, and they've got to be trained, and they have to be safe while they're tracing. You can't just show up in your jeans and T-shirt. You know, you got to really know what you're doing when you're going into these neighborhoods and you're trying to run these leads down. So do you think maybe you could get the, the governors to ask the Congress to fund that as a part of all this money they're giving you? Or maybe it's legal now to spend some of the money, but we need a national core of healthy people who are properly trained to go out and do this contact tracing. We need the bodies. Well, contact tracing for sure. I agree 100%. But I'll tell you the eye-opener for me 
is the, your first point, how little of a public health system we have. Uh, you know, this is, you realize how our health system is really a private sector system. We call them voluntary hospitals. <coughs> but they're not for profits, but they're private sector hospitals. And they run their own businesses. You know, we have downstate New York, right? New York City, Suffolk, Nassau, Westchester, that whole metropolitan area. Uh, we have about 100 hospitals. We have about 13 public hospitals. And the rest are all private hospitals. And when I had to go there and basically ask these private hospitals, you know, we have to work as one because now this is a public health mandate. They're not public health hospitals. They're private hospitals and they have their own clientele and their own patients and their own marketing department and their own market niche. Uh, and they don't coordinate with the others. They just don't do it, you know. Uh, and the capacity and the equipment they had was what the market would support. They didn't create a bed an extra bed in case of catastrophe. They only had the number of beds that they could sell, right, to the market. Uh, so there was no additional capacity beyond what the market would pay for. And I went to the hospitals. You'll get a kick out of this. Uh, we have 50,000 hospital beds. They were projecting that I would need about 140,000 hospital beds. And we only had a capacity of 50. I mandated that the hospitals create an additional 50% capacity in every hospital. You had 100 bed hospital, you had to go to 150 beds. So they were putting beds in auditoriums, they were putting beds in cafeterias, they were converting everything because you did not have any uh, public health uh, capacity in the entire healthcare system. Uh, it's a concept, public health, but there was no physical manifestation of it. There was no capacity. So that's the main eye opener. Uh, this pandemic, we, we're not ready from a public health point of view for any uh, large scale epidemic uh, uh, management. So I, I think when we get a chance to sit back and, and learn the lessons from this uh, crisis. The big eye opener to me is where is your public health system? You teach it in schools, you talk about it a lot, but it doesn't exist. Not in buildings, not in beds, not in equipment, not in staff. Uh, and that's what this really showed us. We, we called up the public health system and nobody came. Well, I think you know, one of the things that we owe it to the country to do is to try to create one for the next time. And I don't want to get ahead of myself. We got to get a hold of this one first. But I, uh, I remember uh, hearing about and then seeing as a young governor 40 years ago that we had a very active public health system in my native state, Arkansas, and a lot of southern states because they had no hospitals during the Depression to speak of, and so a lot of work was being done in the county health units. Then when we were trying to get 90% of our kids immunized against serious childhood diseases, almost everybody in my state, including upper income people, were doing it at the county health unit. And there's some basic public health functions we need to identify and develop the capacity for. That's why this stockpile is so important, uh, and I hope you know, it'll be adequately stocked from now on in. I know you had some real heartburn moments thinking you couldn't get enough ventilators to do uh, what you needed to do. So let me ask you one question in closing. Um, I don't suppose any of us could be surprised by the fact that there was racial disparity in the number of people who were positive for the virus and the death rates. But I think the size of the disparity in some places really shocked people. Uh, we know that African Americans and Latinos or other things being equal, more likely to have diabetes, type two diabetes and 
heart problems and other things. And that makes you more likely to die if you get infected with coronavirus. But what's your take on this and what should we be doing about it? Yeah, I think I think it is in I don't I don't know if it's an eye opener, but I think it's uh, an issue that now no one can deny. Right. It just surfaced a reality that is painful, which we knew was there. But many people wanted to just uh, uh, deny it. The, and I think we're doing more testing in minority areas. We're doing uh, research at those testing sites that goes beyond just the medical tests. Where do you work? Where do you live? What's your health history? What were your health services? Where were you getting health checkups, underlying illnesses, et cetera? So we're trying to accumulate all the data. But I, there's going to be a clear correlation with disparities in health care. There's no doubt about that. And I agree uh, with what you said, Mr. President, there's going to be underlying illnesses and just a general lack of uh, wellness in that community. Our numbers, by the way, are not going to be nearly as bad as many other states in the United States. And that uh, little mm -hmm. bit of comfort in that. We do have a disparity on the Latino and African-American community, but it's in the single digits as opposed to some of these gross disparities we see in other parts of the country. Uh, but there's all what do you think that is? Well, I believe our healthcare system is more equitable here than in other places. And we are very aggressive uh, in reaching out. You know, we're up to 97% of the people in this state have healthcare coverage, 97%. Uh, it's one of the highest percentages in the United States. So our people are covered. And we have been very aggressive about the coverage and the outreach. I think one of the other factors, which is just my guess, I haven't seen any back, uh, backup for this. When we went to essential workforce, uh, what, were the, what was the essential workforce that continued to operate after we closed down? Transit workers, healthcare workers, uh, bus drivers, grocery store workers, pharmacy store workers, truck drivers, that's going to be a, min a largely majority minority workforce. That's going to be African Americans, Latinos. They were out there doing the jobs while everybody else was locked up. They were the public employees who kept society functioning. And they were exposing themselves on a continued basis to the virus while everybody else had the luxury, frankly, of staying at home, right? Not that staying at home was a luxury for anyone because cabin fever is, is very real, as we can all attest, but they were the essential workers. And they stayed out there and they did their job. They were the nurses. They were the orderlies in the hospitals. They were cleaning the hospitals. They kept those subways running. They kept those buses running. They drove the truck to bring the groceries. And they got infected at a higher rate because of it. I believe that's going to be one of the factors. Let me ask you this. What would you say to these young people who are watching this, who are concerned about this, wondering if it's going to compromise their entire future? Some of them may wonder if they'll even be able to finish university, or if they do, whether there'll be anything out there for them to do except be a contact tracer. I mean, what, what are we... What do you say to them? What should, how should they think about this? And what should they personally do? Well, I live with that question every night. Uh, you, were, you were there when my three were born. Uh, I, have, uh, I have them home now. One was supposed to graduate this year in the, the, from college and it ended early. So she's with me and she's uh, bemoaning the fact that she's not going to have a graduation. Uh, on top of everything else that went on. My other two uh, graduated a couple of years ago and they're still trying to figure it out. Uh, but look, there's a, there's a tragedy to this. Uh, and I'll tell you the truth, I'm, I'm sad on a level that after my entire life's work, in many ways we're handing them a planet with more troubles and more issues than the planet that was handed to us. Uh, they have bigger problems than we ever had. 
the environmental problems they have, the economic inequality that they have, uh, the, the, up, the increasing public health issues, uh, the environment's degradation. I mean, they really have more challenges than we did. Uh, I think it has shown the, my kids, that generation, a different aspect of government and politics. It's not just about celebrity and personal style and social media. There is an art form to government. You have to know how to do this. Uh, it's sort of like any other occupation now. A lawyer needs to know how to practice to be a good lawyer. A doctor need, needs to know how to operate. A government official has to know the tools of government. They have to know the, the management of government. They have to know how to pass a piece of legislation. It's not all theory and abstract. Day to day, I'm not doing any theory and abstract. The concept is simple, save lives. Okay, how do you manage the hospital system? Uh, how do you coordinate with the federal government? Uh, how do you balance a budget in the midst of this? You have to, you either know that or you don't. And I think it gives a, a practicality to the competence of the people we pick, which frankly has not been in the political dialogue uh, for many years. It's been all well, about I ideas, ideas that sound good rather than ideas that are good and sound, as my father used to say. So, yeah, we're handing them a difficult, uh, a difficult plate with many issues, but they've also seen that government can make a difference and people can make a difference if they get involved and if they know what they're actually talking about and have the skill and ability to do the job in government. And if they work together and care more about doing the job, then who gets the credit? That's right, that's right. I think Amen. one of the reasons that you have elicited such a strong response from our public here in New York, and obviously, for reasons you've already said, uh, my family and I are very biased in your favor, but I think your response has come from the fact that you played this on the level. You played it as a governor, as a father, as a citizen. You emphasized how to do things, not just what to do. And you took responsibility instead of slinging blame. And I, I admire you and I'm, for doing it. I'm proud of you. And I think that the young people watching us from around the world should remember this. If you're ever in a place of responsibility, first of all, know what you're supposed to know. Secondly, get the people around you who can figure out how to do what you talk about. And thirdly, take the responsibility and shun, don't talk about blaming. Get the job done. There are lives on the line here. We're going to be okay, but it's going to take a while. And I'm glad you're there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. It's my honor to be with you. I miss you. Thank you. I'm Katrina Velasquez-Neros, and the future is fighting for human rights. The future is fighting the opioid epidemic. The future is fighting climate change. And protecting natural resources. Tackling domestic violence. It's empowering refugee women. Zero discrimination and equal job opportunities for everyone. It's equitable access to education. Tackling substance abuse. A disaster resilient world. The future is empowering the next generation of leaders. Please welcome Chelsea Clinton, Vice Chair of the Clinton Foundation. Dr. Vivek Murthy, 19th Surgeon General of the United States. Devi Schrieder, Director of the Global Health Governance Program at the University of Edinburgh. Chen Kuan, Founder and CEO of InforVision. And Ophelia Dahl, Co-Founder of Partners in Health. Good morning, good evening. Uh, thank you for being with us uh, for this conversation around how we respond to kind of the urgency of our COVID crisis today. And I'm so thankful uh, that you all are with us for our very first kind of uh, virtual CGI University panel conversation. 
Uh, and you know, I want to start uh, with uh, you, Dr. Murthy, with our former Surgeon General. Um, if you could just tell us from your perspective how you think we're doing here uh, in the United States in kind of the middle of April and kind of what you think um, we should be doing differently. Well, thank you so much, Chelsea. It's wonderful to be here uh, with all of you. And I just want to reflect on just what an extraordinary moment we're in, a moment of just upheaval uh, where people's lives have been turned upside down. And the truth is most of us have never experienced any like, anything like this in our lifetimes. And the world hasn't really seen a response like this to an infectious outbreak in perhaps a century or more. Uh, so this is something at a moment I think that we will remember for the rest of our lives. When it comes to how the United States is doing, I think there's good news and, and there's bad news. Uh, let me start with the good news. The good news is that some of the measures that we have been taking that we've been asked to take to physically distance ourselves from other people are actually starting to work. We are seeing a flattening of the curve, if you will, a, a reduction in the number of new cases in some of the hardest hit areas of the country, like New York City. We're also seeing some really interesting things happen in terms of an acceleration of adoption of technology, particularly in medicine, where telehealth, the ability to use technology to get health care to people who are far away, is actually being more rapidly adopted out of necessity. It's a technology we've had for a long time, but this pandemic has actually allowed us to, or pushed us to adopt it more quickly. The other thing that we're seeing here is this extraordinary collaboration between research scientists, between people in academia, government, and industry, as they seek to develop a vaccine, but also to test possible therapeutics, medicines that might help to either prevent uh, this, this virus or at least reduce uh, or diminish its severity. And all of that is, is extremely uh, positive. And the reason this is so important because there's the, the bad news as well, which is that in the United States, we have now over 600,000 cases of COVID-19. We've had over 25,000 people die. And unlike um, perhaps what we saw in, in China, where there was at least closer to a, a single peak and then drop off, in the United States, we are going to have multiple peaks in different parts of the country. You know, New York has gone first, but we are now, and after that, we had Michigan and Louisiana, which were states that followed, but now we're seeing surges in Boston, Massachusetts, um, in the D.C., Maryland area, in Florida, where I'm actually speaking to you from right now. And so the, there will be multiple waves in this larger wave that hits the United States, and we are not out of the woods yet. So the social distancing, or as I prefer to think of it, the physical distancing measures that we're taking, while they're effective um, they're, and they're buying us time, they're still going to be necessary for a little while. You know, I'll, I'll lastly say that this, what we've been asking people to do is to make sacrifices to help buy us time. And I want to say a word about what that time is for. It's in part for helping our hospital systems catch up so that they can meet capacity, but also not have to deal with the, the massive surge in cases that we saw in some parts of the world. But we also know that in the United States, what we need to do in order to start opening up again is establish enough testing capacity, the ability to trace and quarantine people, uh, and the ability uh, to ensure that our hospital systems can handle a new wave of COVID-19 cases if they come through. We're working on improving in those three areas, but we're still far behind where we need to be. And so we've got a lot of work to do in the next few weeks if we really want to, to catch up and be in a place where we can start to relax these distancing guidelines. With all of this talk, though, about the direct physical impacts and the, the economic impact you know, of COVID-19, one last cost, if you will, that I think is equally as important is the social cost of COVID-19 and the restrictions that we're seeing. And I worry that we may incur a social recession marked by deepening loneliness as we spend more and more time separated from each other. Uh, I do think that if we, we can either look at this moment in one of two ways, as a moment when we separated further from each other, when we became lonelier, when we experienced deep economic pain, and when we realized how broken our systems were, or we could potentially use this as a moment uh, to rebuild the infrastructure in our country to invoke a so-called Marshall Plan for rebuilding the health infrastructure of America. We can use it as a moment to also refocus on our relationships with each other and to recenter ourselves and recommit, if you will, to making people the center of our lives 
in terms of how we spend our time, how we design our workplaces and schools, and even how we think about public policy. And if we do the latter, my hope is that we will, I believe that we may be able to come out of this pandemic stronger, more deeply connected uh, than we were before it all began. Well, I certainly echo that hope, uh, Vivek, and, and want to talk a bit more about kind of what you termed the social recession uh, that you worry about later in our conversation. But since you did mention one of the things we know we must do, uh, rapidly uh, expand our testing capabilities, you know, introduce massive kind of contact tracing, kind of isolation, hopefully treatment alongside protecting our frontline workers. You know, Ophelia, I'd really um, appreciate hearing your thoughts on this since Partners in Health, um, along with the state of Massachusetts, has launched the largest effort thus far in the United States to do just that. Could you talk a little bit about kind of PIH's experience doing this work elsewhere in the world and kind of what you're hoping to do in Massachusetts for Massachusetts and, and really then hopefully as a model for the rest of the country. Sure. It's good to be here with, with you and, and with all of you on, on the panel too. Yes, um, as, as you know, Chelsea, um, PIH works in 11 countries around the world and we often talk about the five S's. Um, we refer to those uh, as staff, stuff, space systems and social supports. It's one of uh, Paul Farmer's um, acronyms, he tends to like um, uh, those alliterative acronyms, um, but it's actually been useful because we think that those are the critical components of, of effective healthcare delivery. Um, and it's the infrastructure that we work to build and strengthen at, at PHS sites around the world. And here in this country, in the US, um, it's what's needed to something like COVID as well. And I think while we have parts of that system of those components here, we don't have all of them. We have obviously many, many trained doctors, we have nurses, we have um, you know, trained uh, lab technicians, um, but there are also some, some real gaps um, in being able to meet, meet the need right now. So we don't have a particularly robust community level um, set of interventions that, that, that take place in this country. For example, contact tracers or community health workers, and we're lacking in the stuff part as well, um, in the PPE and, and indeed in some of the testing. Um, so Partners in Health has some experience in, in using people within the community um, to help to deliver care. Um, and they've been instrumental actually for, for decades now in helping us with contact, contact tracing, um, as well as um, deliver um, important sort of directly observed therapy and, and, and meds to, to people within the community. So many people are, are too ill, um, sometimes just too poor, have too many barriers to be able to get to medical facilities. Um, so we've, we've always tried to adopt a community-based approach. Um, and we rely just heavily on the hospital-based care in this country. Um, and it seemed to us as though no sort of systematic or um, concerted efforts around contact tracing were taking place in Massachusetts. So um, the governor here, Governor Baker, um, invited us to be part of a consortium um, and to offer some of the insights and experience we've had in other countries in hiring and training a, um, a group, really a, a, a whole cadre of community health workers um, or contact tracers rather. I can't help but say community health workers. And they would be... Um, uh, virtually trained, they are being virtually uh, trained and deployed right now. Um, and this, this, this consortium, this group, we're working with um, Governor Baker's um, health authorities and also um, other people in this consortium like the Broad Institute that's helping to ramp up testing and that sort of thing. Um, and what we would do with this is that we would, this virtual group of contact tracers um, would contact anybody who has tested positive to learn about their recent activities, um, who they may have been in contact with, and ensure that they can take steps to make sure that they can stay healthy and not spread the virus any further. So the partnership essentially is building on infrastructure that already exists in a place like Massachusetts. Um, and it needs to be part of a whole, um, whole system. So that includes you know, ramping up testing. It includes providing uh, really dignified isolation and treatment that, of everyone who's sick. 
And it's ensuring that people can be quarantined um, and at times separated in a very supportive um, way. Um, and then, um, you know, that it, in, in part of our discussions, we have really um, pressed the idea that accompaniment, um, which is something, a sort of a, a core principle of Partners in Health, is part of this. So that people who can't really afford to be isolated or quarantined can be isolated and quarantined. Um, and that means that they would be connected to the social services parts of things so that if somebody on contact with someone says, well, I have two kids at home, I can't necessarily keep myself quarantined, I'm a single mother, I need diapers, I need to go out and get diapers, or we don't have enough food, that they're connected to a system of social supports as well. So that's the kind of general idea um, of it. And, you know, it's going to be enormously complicated, and I don't want in any way to make it sound as though this is going to be a, a, a quick and easy thing. But I do think that it's really important also, you know, when we were hearing about flattening the curve, it just occurred to us that it felt so unaspirational that, you know, we should we should think about pushing that downwards as well. Um, and I think that even though this is, you know, we, we had something like 7,000 people, 9,000 people apply within the first couple of days to be contact tracers so that we can actually use people who are out of place, um, out of work rather, um, who can be trained, even lay people, um, to do this work. It felt like a good, good thing for the economy also. And I think will help down the road um, as surges um, happen or as more of these take place, uh, you know, more, more, um, more, uh, you know, as the surges of this particular um, uh, disease, this virus, in the next uh, eight months or a year or two years, we might even be able to have a kind of a deployable and easily deployable kind of force of people a little bit. I was talking to someone yesterday and they said they refer to it a little bit like a sort of National Guard. Uh, instead of building it from scratch every time, maybe we could have a group of people like this in, in, in all states in the U.S. to be able to help. You know, and, and Devi, I know you've been advocating strongly um, for weeks now, a similar approach kind of for the UK. Could you kind of talk a little bit about kind of what you're kind of seeing happen in the UK and um, kind of what the barriers are to kind of scaling up testing and introducing kind of the contact tracing that thankfully we're going to start seeing in Massachusetts? Yeah, so I think the UK early on, the government made a decision that this virus could not be contained and that the optimal thing to do was to let it run through the population and basically work towards some kind of herd immunity that, you know, the bulk of people get it and as much as possible, you try to shield the vulnerable. And so there was no planning made for actually what it would mean to increase testing, to increase contact tracing capacity or to plan for quarantine facilities. And so um, this was the policy until about mid-March, when I think due to first public backlash, as well as the realization that you cannot perfectly shield the vulnerable, that we don't yet know who the vulnerable are, and that actually you'll lose a lot of lives in that process, that there needed to be a rethinking of the strategy. And I think where we are now in April, there is realization that we need to go to increase our testing massively, and we need to actually think about how do we exit this kind of lockdown um, um, policy that we're under, but it's a real challenge to get testing up because we're so late to the table. And so it's hard to get test kits, it's hard to get reagents, it's hard to have a strategy who gets tested. And so it's really building all those things now from the start. So first, who are your priority groups? So it's only just recently that even health workers could be tested. Before that, the policy was they were not being tested. Um, though you could get test kits in private clinics in London if you were, um, you know, able to pay for it privately. And so that was an issue. Now they've adopted a policy that, you know, health workers are tested, their family members are tested, and household members. You know, the next thing was testing essential workers who are still out, you know, working grocery, uh, people in grocery stores, deliveries, pharmacists, and that's been the next stage. Um, and I think now there's a real thinking about how do we go even further, but capacity is such a challenge. And so it's been with these limited numbers, how do you deploy them most strategically and effectively? Um, and we still haven't gotten to the tracing part yet because there's a lot of reliance on thinking maybe an app could get us out of this, that 
you know, there are discussions around new contact tracing apps, but in the end, you also need people and a lot of kind of labor and how do you recruit that workforce? And so I think we'll see developments here going in that direction, but it's just going to take a lot of time. Well, since you mentioned technology, Debbie and, and Vivek, you mentioned technology kind of early on too. You know, CK, I, I want to turn to you and thank you for your your patience. Um, kind of as as the rest of the panelists engaged, could you talk a little bit about kind of the exciting technology that you've developed that's been deployed um, in Wuhan to try to help with early identification um, of of people who you know, are suspected of of having COVID nineteen kind of what you've seen through that experience and how kind of what you've been doing in China, you know, may be applicable uh, really around the world. Yes. So we in Vision has been specializing in utilizing artificial intelligence to help with medical imaging diagnosis. So in, in fact, we have been working with a few uh, hospitals in Wuhan for quite some quite some time already. In fact, Wuhan Tongji Hospital and Wuhan Zhongnan Hospital, they have been using our artificial intelligence for lung cancer screening for quite some quite some time. And then sometime in January, we actually realized that our uh, customers in uh, Wuhan has been utilizing the technology of lung cancer screening to detect pneumonia, uh, which is a very strange phenomenon at the time. So what we did is that uh, we coupled with the news that there is this at the time, unknown uh, virus outbreak that is going on in Wuhan, and we realized that they are actually fighting this outbreak. So we started to talk to the doctors and the hospitals exactly how we can adapt our technology, repurpose it to help uh, with the fight against the virus. And so uh, they actually bring us like two demands that they actually really want our AI to be able to do to help them fight the virus. The first one is that there's, there's been a lot of in-hospital transmission of the virus. Well, at the time, there is a huge shortage of like testing kits in Wuhan, in Hubei. So what we see is that a lot of patients suspected of COVID-19 is being like queuing up, lining up in the hospital, waiting to be examined, waiting to be seen. But at the same time, there are also some patients and other doctors who are not infected with the COVID-19. They're all like mingling together in the hallway, in the corridors of the hospitals. So they actually really want us to use the AI technology to screen the uh, CT image to identify suspected COVID-19 cases quickly so that they can start the quarantine, they can start the medical observation quickly, while at the same time waiting for the PCR testing, which might take days to come in, so that we can actually reduce the uh, in-hospital transmission risk. And at the same time, they said that, well, if you actually have a, um, uh, if you ha actually have a confirmed patient, then they actually really want AI to be able to quantitatively measure the progress of the pneumonia so that they can see whether or not this patient is in danger of developing into the severe case, which needs more uh, attention. So basically what we did is during the, uh, the uh, spring festival, we developed this AI together with the doctors and we pushed it through. The initial idea was pretty simple to be able to use this AI to help the few hospitals that is fighting the virus. But, but we, we actually see the virus like spreading outside of Hubei to other provinces in China and also outside of China. And that's the time in which we started to deploy the system to other hospitals and other countries. Thank you, CK. Um, I think, you know, Vivek, one of the things that I know you've been really passionate about, not only in the last few months, but really throughout your career, is trying to help um, fight false information um, around kind of health broadly, public health, Kind of patient health. And clearly one of the challenges I think that we're all grappling with at this moment, which Debbie really alluded to, is how much we don't know about COVID still, about kind of who are the most vulnerable, how kind of is it really uh, transmitted, kind of what are the possible symptoms, kind of what is the trajectory of, of the disease. And I think unfortunately that has created even more opportunity um, for sometimes well-meaning people who are kind of putting out false information and sometimes kind of charlatans who are peddling kind of false information or, or you know, in, improper treatments. Could you kind of talk about kind of how you think all of us kind of in this conversation today and really anyone listening can ensure that they are getting reliable information, that they are only transmitting reliable information, uh, even if that information itself is uncertain and, and may change? 
Yeah, well, thanks, Chelsea. It's such a good question. And, you know, as Davy had mentioned earlier, we are actively learning about this virus while we're at the same time trying to address it. And this is a really tricky situation to be in. It's not unique. Uh, in the past, when when I was in government, we were dealing with the, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, as well as uh, the Zika uh, virus. And prior to, to my time in government, there was H1N1. There, there have been outbreaks over time that have been novel. And that is really the tricky part of this response is that you're learning, but you also have to act, which means that sometimes you'll take actions that you'll realize were perhaps wrong or you need to change direction uh, as you learn more information. And this can be really tricky uh, because a, a pandemics like this are extraordinarily scary to people for good reason. Um, you know, People are wondering if they're gonna get sick. They're wondering if they're gonna lose their loved ones. And fear does something to how we absorb information. You know, it We reach for information that may be more favorable, even if it's not true. Um, we tend, but at the same time, we need information that's more truthful to help us figure out how to stay safe and how to take care of our loved ones. Um, so for example, in the midst of COVID-19, if you were really scared about what this virus could do and you hurt somebody who said, don't worry, it's not that big of a deal. It's going to blow over. There's a part of your mind psychologically that wants to believe that because to believe otherwise will mean that people you love are at risk and that you might have to turn your life upside down. And so that's why I think whether you're in government or whether you're the leader of an organization uh, or whether, frankly, you're even talking to your extended family and you're trying to think about how to communicate with them, uh, I feel, I've found that there are a few key principles that, that are important to keep in mind. So one is that it's, it's essential, especially for leaders, to be transparent and truthful in the, in the information they're sharing. This may seem obvious, but it actually doesn't always happen, even despite the best intent. Uh, sometimes, you know, you can put out some information but not be entirely clear about where it's coming from. Um, classic example, when people were asking the United States, how many tests have we performed uh, and what are the results of those tests across the country? That information wasn't readily available from the CDC. I don't think it was because scientists at the CDC had nefarious intentions, but the lack of transparency bothered people and it instilled seeds of doubt about whether the information they were getting was trustworthy and that was problematic. So transparency and truthfulness is essential as a backbone. The second principle that's really important is, is consistency of com communication. When you lurch from one position to another, it also shakes people's confidence, makes them wonder if you, if you know what you're doing. And being consistent doesn't mean that you should never change your mind though. Um, you just have to explain why you're changing your mind clearly uh, with evidence so that people understand why you're doing that. A good example of that was actually California. In California, counties, as well as the state, took a series of steps uh, to ultimately issue, a, we call them, which culminated in a stay-at-home order or actually a shelter-in-place order. Um, but there were a number of steps that preceded that. And in each point in the way, they didn't say, oops, we were wrong, we had to do more. What they said is, based on what we know today, this is the decision we're making. If it changes, we will let you know. A few days later, we got new information. Here's how it's changing our thinking, so we're taking this new action. That kind of, of explanation is essential because uh, you need to pivot, but consistency is, is critical. The third is, is it's really important to over-communicate. You know, a lot of times we think, hey, we said this, people should get it. But especially when your mind is in a state of stress or anxiety, you're not hearing everything uh, that, that's coming at you. And beyond that, we now know that people get their news through so many different channels. So making sure that we're over-communicating, especially recognizing that information is a, can be a source of comfort if it's accurate, trustworthy information, that's essential. And the, the last two I'll mention is, is that it's really important, uh, number four, to, to lead with science and scientists. It, it, when you walk into uh, you know, you know, a press room and you're in front of cameras and you're gonna be speaking to everyone in your county or in your state or in your country, or maybe even in the world, there's tremendous pressure to deliver good news, to tell everyone that things are, uh, you know, are, are peachy clean and that we're, we have nothing to worry about. But you have to resist that temptation. You've got to be real with people, but you also have to let the scientists speak and let them lead with their evidence. Uh, and that's why I think part of leadership is knowing when to step up, but also when to step back uh, and put the right faces in front of cameras. And finally, I think perhaps most importantly, I think it's essential to communicate with compassion and with empathy because these moments are extraordinarily difficult. 
uh, for everyone. And I think that, you know, it, it, while people deal with that tension in different ways, some people may become combative and angry, others might become sullen uh, and, 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 and withdrawn. You know, everyone is struggling in some way in moments like this. And I think that's especially important as we think about our friends and our family members and as we seek to communicate with them. You may have a friend who posts something, you know, on social media that's utterly false. Uh, but the right way to deal with that is not to lambaste them for being, you know, a fear monger or for being a, somebody who's misrepresenting the truth. Uh, but it's to ask a deeper question, what are they going through? What might be driving this? And to approach it with compassion and say, they're probably hurting. They're probably scared in the same way that I'm hurting and scared. And to connect with them on, on that level. But when I think, you know, in closing about all of the conversations I've had with people in, in Washington, D.C. about how we overcome these big divides, there are often information divides between us. Sometimes there's this idea that if we just got people in the same room to share their views, that they would find some common ground. But I actually don't think that actually works. I think what works to build actual communication with people is to start by building relationship first, to get to understand another human being. What are their experiences? What are their values? What are the things you share with them in terms of family, in terms of common concerns, common aspirations? Once you build a relationship, it's much easier to have conversations about difficult topics, whether they're challenges around, you know, getting people on the same page about vaccines or getting the right information to people about COVID-19. But this is why the breakdown of social relationships and connections in our country and around the world has been so consequential. It's not just about people feeling bad and feeling more lonely. It's not just about the powerful impact that has on our health and our lifespan and our risk of cardiovascular disease, but it's also affects our ability to dialogue with each other. We can't dialogue, we can't share information. If we can't share information, we can't protect ourselves and each other. Well, and, and Vivek, I would just say, um, arguably you just also described on an institutional level, kind of the logic for why we need the World Health Organization. Um, and you know, WHO is under enormous um, kind of strain and stress right now, uh, especially from our government, but not only from our government. And Debbie, you and I have um, spent years kind of debating what we think kind of the right and appropriate role for WHO is. And I hope you could just share your thoughts on kind of how you think WHO has done so far in this moment and kind of why we do desperately need it to be um, an effective leader, including kind of as a public health communicator. Yeah, so WHO was established to be the lead coordinator and director of international health work. And it has unique abilities, including the international health regulations, which is how we actually even know if there's a novel pathogen or some kind of new viral outbreak in a country. Um, and so we can criticize it. Um, we can wish it was different. We can build an ideal institution, but it's what we have. And looking back at it, it has done much, much better than it has in previous crises. Um, it has been as fast as I think you can reasonably expect of an international institution. And yes, it's gotten criticism for not, you know, being harsher on China, but they have to work with China. You know, there is no point in January them calling out China and saying, you know, you've made this mistake or that mistake or why did you do that? Because behind the scenes, they needed to get the sequencing data out so that actually we could have PCR testing. They needed to get the, you know, reporting out of who was being affected. And we found out, you know, you know, age related mortality. We found out a bit about children. There were a lot of open questions. And rather than governments having to scramble as soon as a viral, you know, they started seeing pneumonia cases in their own country, we had, you know, the benefit of time and some insights from China on what was coming. And a lot of it actually is proving correct what they were saying in January in terms of the early clinical studies. Um, so WHO is absolutely essential. And we have to remember that it's already underfunded. It has a, you know, annual budget of two billion and cutting, you know, hundreds of millions is a lot of money for the WHO. It's very, very insignificant to a high income government. Um, and right now I am worried because we can have our COVID response and focus on it, but what about all the other things that we're forgetting about? So polio, you know, campaigns being put on hold for six months. What about, you know, measles? What about TB? What about even things like cholera and Haiti and, you know, 
plague and yellow fever. I mean, this is going to have knock on effects. And so actually, you know, the United States might see it that WHO is not useful for its interests in the short term, but actually it's incredibly useful. And, you know, cutting the budget only hurts, you know, the United States because one thing we've learned from this crisis is our world is interconnected. And so what's happening in a remote part of a country somewhere else across the world will come to you. And we do need some kind of international agency to manage that and to share information. And, 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 and as, as Blaine passes around, the thing I keep trying to say is, you know, 31st December, China notified the WHO country office about this. Um, most governments knew about this in early January. I mean, South Korea was moving from the 2nd of January. And so we can look at what happened in December in terms of delays in reporting to WHO. But we're now in April, and a lot of the debates we're having now is how do we get diagnostic capacity? The countries that were able to use that data that they got at the end of December were building diagnostic capacity in January. And so I think um, we basically right now have to, you know, look forward, say this is what we have, and we can do a review afterwards, we can look at missteps, we can see how we can improve. But I've been generally um, pretty impressed with how WHO has managed a very tense situation and an ongoing geopolitical, you know, war between two superpowers, and it was trade, it was economics, now it's coronavirus, and a lot of other countries are going are gonna to suffer as this war continues between them two. I, I agree uh, emphatically and, and sadly. In our last few minutes, um, just as we try to focus on what any of the CGIU students listening can do, you know, Ophelia, I wonder if we can kind of start with you and then really just go around. You know, what would you say to young people who you know, are looking to get engaged, who want to be part of a meaningful response, whether that is kind of in a, in a virtual sense or if they kind of want to sign up as, as contact tracers with your efforts, you know, and really would be helpful to hear kind of you know, your thoughts on how young people can help each other, even while we are distant, to kind of ameliorate that sense of isolation and loneliness and CK, kind of where you think real opportunities are for entrepreneurs kind of in this crisis. And um, you know, then kind of Debbie will give you the final word, but maybe kind of Ophelia, if we can um, kind of just hear what you think kind of any anyone, whether they're in Massachusetts or not, kind of could do in this moment? Sure. Um, you know, I have to say, listening to this excellent, uh, excellent group here, it, it uh, thinking about um, all of this collective knowledge, just even on this panel, it, it lifts my spirits enormously to think about all the people that are working on these kinds of problems. Um, and I couldn't help but reflect as I was listening to other people speak here, just how, um, uh, how difficult is that the infectious quality of this virus means not unlike um, Ebola, that the caregivers have to do such, uh, such protective equipment that it sort of takes away, um, creates barriers between them and the patients. And I, I was just, you know, just really thinking about if I was ill, how I would want anyone on this panel, maybe not, uh, maybe only the ones who were medically qualified to give me care, but how comforted I would be to hear you all, hear your voices um, if I was sick. But just to your question, because I know we're, 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 we're zooming down on time here, but, um, you know, I think that being connected to people, learning about this, learning in an informed way is part of what, what I think um, uh, young people can do. Um, getting connected to groups, realizing that the part, the things that they're passionate about already, whether or not it's you know sports or science or entrepreneurism, that that to get to connect to other people, especially now on um, you know online and and start chats and just begin talking with people about what it is, how they can um, add muscle or add experience. Um, what it is, I think that there's no shortage of that could use their ideas and their experience. And indeed, if it is in contact tracing, um, you know, to connect organizations that are doing um, that are doing work in this field. I know that it keeps my spirits lifted to be able to work with a group of people, of colleagues who are who are trying to make changes all the time, although we often go 10 steps backwards to come four forward. Um, but yes, I would say totally get get connected and and feel free to jump onto the PA site and look at the contact tracing. Um, opportunities there. Vivek? Well, thanks, Chelsea. I, uh, you know, I think that there's a tremendous amount that young people can do now to help address the COVID-19 crisis. And it may not feel like that. It may feel like if you don't have a medical or nursing degree that you can't help, if you don't have a high position government that you can't do much. 
but three things I'll mention that you can do that are extraordinarily helpful. One is staying at home. The physical distancing that you are observing, the sacrifices that so many young people have made to miss graduations, to miss their hanging out with their friends, to miss time spent with family, as painful as that is, that is the critical part of what is helping to reduce the peak of infections in so many communities around the world. The second thing I would mention is as much as it is important for us to ensure that the government responds in an effective way to support uh, people in terms of economic, you know, economic support and infrastructure during these troubled times, there's a level of support that can only be provided by other people in their life. If you have a neighbor who's struggling, um, who is scared to go out and get groceries, a call from you uh, can make a world of difference. You know, if you have a coworker um, or a classmate who might be struggling to figure out how to take care uh, of elderly parents while also managing classwork or managing to, to work uh, at the same time by telework, you know, simply reaching out to that person and, and having food delivered to them or sending them a thoughtful message can make a big difference uh, in their day. So as you think about how to help, think very locally about the people around you and in your life. And finally, I would say that this is a time where a lot of people, if not everyone, is struggling emotionally to some degree to figure out how to cope with this new reality uh, that we find ourselves in. And that means that people have a great deal of more stress and anxiety uh, than they may have had before. Simply reaching out to friends, to family members, to coworkers, just to ask how they're doing, and then just listening uh, as they speak can be extremely powerful you know, we live in a society that feels very action-oriented, where we feel like we've got to fix people's problems. We've got to, you know, take care of what, what ails them. But I'll tell you that one of the greatest gifts that we can give other people is the gift of our full attention. And five minutes of listening deeply to someone, sharing openly with them, and simply being, can be deeply healing in a way that 30 minutes of distracted conversation simply can't be. So keeping all of these in mind, I would just remember that at a time when the world is hurting deeply, that you have the power within you to be healers, and to help reduce that pain, and to help bring people a degree of comfort and help uh, that millions, if not billions of people all over the world desperately need right now. Thank you, Vivek. CK, do you have any thoughts, especially for kind of students who may be listening to what you've done and think, you know, I have an idea of a piece of technology that also could be you know, hugely impactful either for COVID or kind of for whatever may come next, because we know there will be a next, whatever that may be. Yes. So my advice to young technology entrepreneurs who can have the capability of do something about uh, either this current outbreak or something that comes next is to get in the ditch. So basically, uh, one of the examples that we confronted in the, in, in during this COVID-19 crisis is that when we first deploy our system in one of the hospitals in the early early outbreak, uh, in, in fact, at the time, the protect, protective gears is in huge shortage. So the doctors, they actually hope that we can install the AI within the quarantine area, which is actually quite dangerous with uh, confirmed cases. So for the, for the, when we talk about the financial rewards that, that we can offer our team members, it's totally not worth risking their life trying to do that. But at the same time, they feel that, well, uh, they really want this technology to work. Actually, the team member actually later told me that she was actually very afraid and she is actually very scared, but she still chose to go in and install the AI for the doctors. And later on, the AI actually helped the, the hospitals find out there is a COVID-19 carrier. So I think for any technology, when we think about it, it's always very shiny, it's always very flashy. But if you really want the technology to help, you have to put it down from the sky to the earth to be, able, to be able to really do something about it. So I think this is my advice to young entrepreneurs to really get in the ditch. That's great advice. And Devi, any any final thoughts on kind of what you would want students listening to, to think yeah. about what they could be? So three quick things, because I know we need to wrap. And the first is really to remember the importance of your voice and voting. That if you're unhappy with something, that there's no... Um, insurance for your family members, if you're unhappy because you don't understand why certain policies are being enacted, you know, voting is such a powerful act in itself and not to forget this crisis the next time that there's an election. 
The second would be that, um, and Vivek has mentioned this, many people are angry right now. They're going through a lot of uncertainty. And so just to have a bit more leeway with people and a bit more compassion, like you never know what someone's going through. And a lot of times when people react badly, it has more to do with what's going on in their life than actually anything to do with, with you. And I guess the third one and something I've been struggling with even myself is, you know, we are going into uncharted territories. Like this is psychologically quite difficult because we like certainty, especially like personality types. I'm a planner. Like I want to know what's going to happen in three months and in six months. And that's how I plan my diary. And to now have a world where we don't know what will August look like, what will December look like, what will 2022 look like? Um, it is, it is hard. And that it's actually, it's okay to not be okay. That that's actually pretty normal right now to feel quite unsettled. Um, cause it goes against kind of how we feel and actually, and, and, you know, as the panel saying, just talk about it and, and be quite open about it. It's not anything, I think, shameful or anything to be embarrassed about. I think even public health experts and leaders are grappling right now of what the summer is going to look like. And so, of course, you know, to recognize that your own mental health and your own well-being is, is also vitally important right now. Well, thank you all. Thank you all for your time today. Um, and even more, thank you all for all that you're doing to help um, protect uh, patients and people in public health today and into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Katrina Velasquez-Neros, and the future is fighting for human rights. The future is fighting the opioid epidemic. The future is fighting climate change. And protecting natural resources. Tackling domestic violence. It's empowering refugee women. Zero discrimination and equal job opportunities for everyone. Equitable access to education. Tackling substance abuse. The disaster resilient world. The future is empowering the next generation of leaders. Please welcome William Jefferson Clinton, founder and board chair of the Clinton Foundation and 42nd President of the United States, and Gavin Newsom, Governor of California. Governor Newsom, thank you for joining us, and thank you for your extraordinary leadership during this COVID-19 crisis. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin with a question that was raised this week in the press when you and your colleagues out there, the governors of Oregon and Washington, said you would try to follow a joint plan to reopen the economy. And uh, I th I'd like to tell everybody else in America and around the world that that should be important to them because before this happened, California's economy was growing at 3.8% a year. That's 50% faster than the U.S. economy as a whole was growing. So we need you back, but you can't really get back unless you know your people are going to be safe. So yep. if you could keep in mind, we got 800 students here from all around the world, about 100 countries. Uh, they're in different situations. But they all want California back. And so what are the criteria that you and your colleagues uh, in Washington, Oregon, Jay Ansley and Kate Brown, are going to decide uh, will determine opening the economy? I appreciate that, Mr. President. Let me just stipulate what you said is true. The 3.8 percent is average GDP growth over the last five years. Uh, last year, we ran a $21.4 billion operating surplus, and we're really proud of California's growth that's now pushed us as the fifth largest economy in the world. Uh, we talk about ourselves in terms of being a nation state. It's figurative, not literal, uh, but it's a state of 40 million people, 27 percent of Californians foreign born, uh, and we're very prideful of that. But we're also uh, very impacted by macroeconomics. And as a consequence, we tend to do a little bit better in the good times and a little bit worse in the bad times. Well, bad times are upon us and we're very, very cautious and concerned. 2.7 million Californians have filed for unemployment insurance claims uh, just in the last 32 days. And so the pressure is on all of us to talk about not just health, but also the economy 
and talk about the economy in the context of how that impacts public health as well. And rather than doing it alone, we're trying to do it together. I think that's the old African proverb uh, that I heard uh, from you a decade or two ago it said, if you wanna go fast, go alone. But if you wanna go far, go together. And so we wanna extend the relationship, extend the narrative of support uh, up and down uh, the coast here in North America, in Oregon, Washington, California, share best practices and approaches. And we've laid out six criteria uh, that we believe can become best practices in terms of how we toggle from moving beyond the stay-at-home orders and then push further on more restrictive strategies where individuals will be required to do more for themselves as we start to phase in an opening of our economies. Thank you very much. I, I'd, I'd like to ask about one other contemporary issue and then we'll talk about the management of this epidemic more generally. When I saw the stories in the last couple of weeks or uh, last week about the dramatic difference in the impact of COVID-19 in some states on people based on race and income, I wasn't surprised that there was a disparity. I was surprised that the disparity was so deep. That disparity is yeah. much less in California. It exists, but it's less. And it's also surprisingly less in New York, even though, as you know, as the two biggest cities in the two states, New York City and LA have discovered it's harder to social distance and harder to keep down the casualties if you have a lot of poor neighborhoods. But the racial disparity is less. Why do you think that is? And what would you advise uh, the federal government to do, the Congress to do, and what could we help the other states do who are dealing with these the racial disparities where the mortality rate is basically two and a half to one? No, it's, it's such an important question, and it just highlights disparities that are really America's pre-existing condition, and that is the disparities in access uh, on environmental justice as a frame, uh, on issues large and small around income and wealth inequality in this nation all uh, uh, underlie and undergrid the answer to why uh, I believe those disparities uh, persist differently across this country. I'm very proud of the state of California. You're right. Uh, we are underrepresented uh, for Latinos, underrepresented for Asians, slightly overrepresented uh, in the African-American community. But I think the reason it's not, we're not an outlier in terms of the extreme and the opposite direction is California's commitment uh, to health care. Uh, there's simply not a state in America uh, that is doing more uh, to provide high quality health care uh, across the spectrum. We tried to bring back, we did bring back uh, the individual mandate as part of the three-legged stool in the state of California. We expanded subsidies into the middle class, people earning up to $150,000. Uh, we deepened subsidies uh, for low-income workers. Uh, just, Mr. President, in the last three weeks, we extended our open enrollment uh, for the Affordable Care Act. We extended it for 58,000 individuals just in three weeks to capture more people so that we can provide preventative care, not just sick care on the back end and do so in a way that's truly bottom up, culturally competent, uh, in a way that does justice uh, to all. That said, those disparities nonetheless persist uh, and we have a lot of work to do in California and across this country. But it also indicates why the country should do more to expand access to healthcare in general. Uh, That's right. That's right. Let me ask you one other thing. Uh, one of the elements, key elements, in your plan to be able to reopen California, and I liked it, by the way, because you didn't overpromise. You didn't promise you could do things you couldn't, and you made it clear that unless you could do it without more people getting sick and dying, 
it couldn't be done. But one of the things that you have to be able to do is to track people who are positive. Where were they? Who were they in contact with? How can you hem up any recurrence of this? Uh, Massachusetts has recently announced that they're going to try to build a statewide tracking program, and they've asked partners in health to run it for them. And they're one of my partners in the work we've done in Africa, Haiti, and other places. But where are we going to get all these contact tracers? Uh, <laughs> should we have, like, should, like you did with the, California did with the Conservation Corps of Young People, should we have a contract tracer core, even if we call it something more elegant? Should we yeah. really build the first public health network we've ever really built in this country around this issue? Uh, I think the answer is absolutely yes. And, and I, I love the Massachusetts example. We were able to learn uh, from them. We're all sharing best practices in real time. Uh, but this is an interesting point that's often not brought up. Uh, we have tracing capacity that predates COVID-19. It goes back to SARS, measles, TB, uh, et cetera. Tracking and tracing capacity that exists in the county levels primarily uh, and increasing capacity at the state level. So what we're doing is we're building off that existing infrastructure and using the tools of technology to overlay. But in addition to that, we're using AmeriCorps specifically. I uh, thank you as a champion for AmeriCorps. Uh, for decades, uh, we've been able to take advantage of that workforce, obviously our conservation uh, core. What we have now is called Cal Volunteers in the spirit of Sarge Shriver. Uh, we are asking people, thousands of folks, to be part of this new core, to get trained and to help us with the tracing, because you're absolutely right. The predicate for getting back to some semblance of normalcy is our ability to identify individuals through testing, to be able to trace their contacts to isolate individuals uh, that have uh, either uh, been exposed or quarantined people that are tested positive. And that's just gonna require an army of folks and the capacity of consideration from individuals to allow uh, for their privacy uh, to be impacted by that kind of acuity of attention based upon where they've been and who they talked to. Well, let me say, for the Americans listening to this, I think that the expansion of AmeriCorps is a great idea. And those who are university students will know that if you do a year or two in AmeriCorps, you acquire uh, also, in addition to the modest salary you make, you get payment for college expenses. But, and in other countries, people who are from other countries, they still may be able to develop that. Uh, but what do they need to do this safely? That I think a lot of young people are going to be listening to this thinking, you know, maybe I should be a community worker. But I, what do I need? Gloves? Do I need a mask? Do I need a uniform? Do I need whatever? Where am I going to go? And I'm more than happy to take some risk but I want it to be prudent within this sphere of accepted public health practices. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's the right question. And that, by the way, begs uh, many other considerations and questions that we need to raise around PPE, not just N95 masks, surgical masks, but shields, gowns, gloves, coveralls, uh, and the like. Uh, but absolutely why the predicate for any tracing capacity is training. And in that training are the answers to that question. It's not just the intellectual capacity to understand how to do the job. It's the capacity to deliver that job at the grassroots in communities, large and small, with the appropriate level of protection uh, of one's individual, as well as the broader uh, community that can be impacted. This, by the way, Mr. President, remains the foundational question, is the ability uh, not just to trace uh, and track, but also to test at capacity. And then moreover, if you're going to isolate and quarantine people, uh, to have the capacity of resources to do that and a workforce that can help surge that capacity to help support those individuals with wraparound services that have their appropriate healthcare needs met as well. Well, let me ask you something to follow up with that. Uh, just a few days ago, 
you and your colleagues in Washington and Oregon announced that you were going to send some ventilators back east to places where there are more people infected because you thought you had the capacity to deal with what you would face without them because you have leveled the playing field, you've leveled the curve. Why do you think that is? What did you do that has made this less bad than the experts told you it was going to be a month or six weeks ago? You know, I love to say about life, you know, life doesn't happen uh, to you. You want to make life happen for you. That, that future is not just up to an experience. Uh, it's something to manifest. It's decisions that will determine our fate, not conditions. And so the answer to the question, Mr. President, very directly, it was the sum total of millions of good decisions by 40 million Californians in the aggregate that took seriously the nation's first stay-at-home order and practiced physical distancing. And when they had to do essential service and essential work and go to the grocery store and get medicines, uh, they appropriately practiced physical distancing and started to wear face coverings. And that, you saw, had a direct impact on buying us time, on stretching this curve and bending the acuity of its growth allowed us to build capacity, build our assets, get more PPE in, 42.2 million N95 masks we've been able to distribute. And I couldn't be more proud. Today, we added another 50 ventilators we sent to Michigan. We sent others to New Jersey, Illinois, DC, Nevada, and other parts uh, of the country. And we wanna do more still as we are starting to bend uh, this curve into a new new status in terms of this epidemic. But again, I caution we're not out of the woods yet. Are you going to have all the tests and uh, testing uh, evaluation you need? Will your capacity there be enough when you want to do massive contact tracing? Uh, at the moment, uh, I would be speculating. In the moment, based on speculation, the answer is no with what I know today. This has been a point of deep angst and frustration. While California has excelled in so many categories, we have not in testing. And I own that and I've taken responsibility to do more and better for 40 million Americans that happen to live in this state. That said, uh, we are seeing significant increase in our testing capacity. Uh, we'll get up to 20, 25,000 tests a day in the next week or so, but we need to be doing multiples of that. We get the serology tests that are coming in, the blood-based tests, that should help in this respect. Our biggest limitation in California has been on the media and the diagnostic side, swabs and the media to carry the swabs. So the diagnostic side, uh, has actually, or rather, the specimen side has impacted the diagnostic side of things. It was reagents, RNA extraction kits, forgive me for confusing people, except to say there's always been one part missing. Now we're getting a handle on that, and as we move to these blood-based tests, antibody tests, as they're referred to, these serum tests, uh, I think that capacity will start to grow exponentially. But right now, we're not close as a nation, let alone as a state, to where we should be on testing. Well, I think that's going to be our next big challenge. Even if you get an army of young AmeriCorps volunteers to be contact tracers, it'll only work if they have the kind of masking testing that is a predicate to their success. One other right. thing I was going to ask is the one thing that the governors I've talked to, including several Republican governors of small states, one thing they always say is, why are we buying all this stuff in a bidding war with California and New York? And then they never say anything bad about you. It's interesting. They say, <laughs> why are we why are we doing this? This is a stupid way to run a railroad. Shouldn't we have a bulk purchasing system where we we know who's going to produce what and we guarantee them a fair price? That is, their cost of production, price of reasonable profit and nobody bids against anybody else, and then we give it out the way you're sending the ventilators back east based on need. So, yeah, uh, I mean, the answer is, 
you're right about that. They're right about that. And, and, and you're also right about California status. Outside the federal government, this state could procure more PPE than any other state in the nation. Let me be specific about that. Uh, we just committed $1.485 billion, $1.5 billion uh, for PPE uh, because of our capacity uh, to write a large check uh, and be able to procure a massive amount uh, of new supply. Uh, we were able to go uh, into mainland China and help get a new factory operationalized that potentially will bring out upwards of 150 uh, million units, 150 million units of masks on a monthly basis. Uh, and you're right that that's not right broadly considering that's one state uh, where we should be uh, coordinating those efforts. Here's the good news, um, Mayor, or rather Governor Inslee and uh, Governor Pritzker and others, we brought their procurement folks, working with our procurement folks to start to coordinate and collaborate a little bit more. I don't wanna overstate how well the collaboration's going, but it's an indication that if you don't like the way the world looks when you're standing up, stand on your head, go local at the state level and the local level. There are partnerships and capacity building that is taking shape that is organically answering the question. Uh, but we sure as hell, forgive my language, Mr. President, should have started there. So what would you do if like the governors of five tiny states called you and asked you if they could ride along in your purchasing group? Well, we, they're already doing that, and we are, we are all in. We're Americans first. Uh, we happen to have 40 million Americans living in the great state of California. Uh, my responsibility is to do everything I can to meet need. Uh, and if there's an acuity of need, we are going to uh, do everything we can to turn uh, our support and our power in that direction. Uh, but we are, I think, in a position uh, as we move into the next phase of this pandemic uh, and we see flattening uh, of curves across this country, able, I think, to take a step back and really formalize these one-off relationships and start organizing at a subnational level, uh, at the gubernatorial level and the local and regional level a little bit more effectively. So I think you're gonna see in the next few months uh, that capacity really takes shape and those efforts advance even more than they have so far. That's great. I'm very grateful to you for that. Um, oh, thank you. What do you think, you have a lot of companies in California who are participating in this race to find if not a cure, at least a treatment that will keep people out of the hospital, off the ventilator, and out of death. And if we do that, that's more than 90% of what we have to do. I think the likelihood of that happen, happening is greater just because of all the research that was done on Ebola, as well as cholera, AIDS, a lot of other things. There's a lot of stuff going on. Do you believe that you have any sense that we'll get any kind of breakthrough in the next few months? And does California have the ability to produce anything they find in massive volumes? Yeah, I think it's, it's the right question. And by the way, one of our six this is one of our six key indicators in terms of our ability to begin to toggle and start uh, pulling uh, back on our stay-at-home orders, the capacity for therapeutics to be delivered and distributed as well as manufactured. A lot of the manufacturing happens here in the state of California. And as you know, Mr. President, California is the birthplace of biotech, life science, bioinnovation, biotherapeutics, Genentech in 1979 in partnership with the UCs and Stanford University. We're blessed because of your support going back uh, decades, the work you did on genomics, the work uh, down in Southern California and San Diego, where so much of this research and development uh, is being advanced. So we have companies like Genentech and Gilead and others. They are manufacturers, not just headquartered companies in the state of California. We've got a team. We meet virtually every single week with representatives from these companies and research institutions and academia getting the latest on these trials, not just therapeutic trials, uh, but also vaccine-related uh, trials. Some of the real work 
some of the most exciting work that's being done on vaccines is happening uh, here as well in the state of California. It's an area we don't want to overpromise and we don't want to start promoting particular products or regime or regimes, uh, but it is an area of some optimism as we move forward in the capacity for the states, Massachusetts, Texas, so many parts of the country uh, to really be front and center, tip of the spear uh, in terms of the therapeutic side of this. It's very exciting. Let me ask you uh, one other question, and then I've got a wrap-up question. I'll give you a chance to, to close because I know you're busy. But what non-medical challenges are you facing? Do the food pantries have enough food? Uh, are the livers, you know, uh, I work with Jose Andre and World Central Kitchen, and uh, we've uh, <laughs> made thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of meals available in, around my library in Little Rock. And he just opened up an operation in Oakland with your friend, the mayor <laughs> yeah. there. So yeah. I know you've got the regular, the people that do this, the Lord's work all the time, but I keep reading that a lot of places are going to be short of food. So how are you on that? You know, not only short of food, but short of volunteers helping distribute the food. Uh, we we send our first cohort of the National Guard out uh, on a humanitarian mission, not an enforcement mission, to help supplement the food banks uh, and to get in the cranes in the back of the factories to help with logistics and to help with the distribution. There's nothing more heartbreaking, particularly in the United States of America, a nation so well resourced to see these long miles of cars backed up. It also underscores, again, the original sin in this country, uh, and that is income again and wealth inequality, which was growing and growing and growing uh, before this crisis. And if there's any moment to reflect and pause on reimagining the future to substantively address not just growth, but inclusion at the same time, I hope it's now. But let me just say on the issue of inclusion, I'll tell you what is so ennobling, and you're a perfect example of that, the work you're doing uh, here at CGI and partnership with, Seth, uh, with Chef Jose, is all the moral authority that's being expressed every single day. We spend so much time talking about people in positions of formal authority, people with, with titles, uh, governors, mayors, congressmen, presidents. But at the end of the day, the most extraordinary leaders are people like Chef Jose uh, that don't wait to be something to do something. And what he has done at scale, uh, not asking for permission, just forgiveness to meet this moment is really inspiring. And I think perhaps the most important uh, lesson that I learned in my life, and I hope a lesson that can be absorbed in the young people watching, is their capacity to be leaders and not wait around uh, again uh, for position and title, uh, but to exercise your capacity uh, in your neighborhood uh, by just lifting out and reaching out and help lift somebody else up. And, and I think that is what is so inspiring at this moment. It gives me just absolute hope and optimism. And I don't say that lightly or flippantly. I mean that at the core of my soul. I have been just mesmerized by the sense of communitarianism and commonwealth, a recognition of the other uh, at this moment. If we could just capture that spirit as a throughput out of this crisis, sky's the limit in terms of what we're capable of doing as a world community, not just as a nation. Thank you. I. That's what I always love about California and what I hope the country will model and the world will model. I, uh, I'll let you go, but I would uh, thank you for what you said. And I hope the students listen to your answer. And we talked about making contact tracing safe enough with medical equipment. We got to do that for volunteers. Even we're having trouble at my library keeping our volunteers up enough for the demand for the meals. So if all of you who are listening to us today and watching us, if you want to do something, start first in your home in America or somewhere else and make sure people have enough to eat. And then if they don't, what you can do to help. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for your magnificent leadership and uh, Godspeed. Thank you, Mr. President. Honored to be with you today.
I'm Katrina Velasquez-Neros, and the future is fighting for human rights. The future is fighting the opioid epidemic. The future is fighting climate change. And protecting natural resources. Tackling domestic violence. It's empowering refugee women. Zero discrimination and equal job opportunities for everyone. It's equitable access to education. Tackling substance abuse. A disaster resilient world. The future is empowering the next generation of leaders. We were looking to find a new way that we could help with the coronavirus pandemic. We found that although resources have been allocated in multiple places and there is a willingness of the population to donate, there isn't a centralized resource on a global scale that enables both individuals and corporate to do that. WorldCareMap.com serves as a hub where people in need can access hyperlocal global health resources and take their next step toward recovery. As you know, the world is right now tackling the COVID-19 pandemic and we decided to step up and use our expertise under grid to, to tackle the COVID-19 crisis um, because this is not only a pandemic, but it's also being called by WHO an infodemic. As an emergency room resident during the COVID-19 pandemic, my goal remains focused on providing the best medical care possible for the patient in front of me. This means that regardless of whether they are COVID positive or presenting with other symptoms, the reason I still go into the hospital is to provide the best care I can alongside my co-residents, attendings, nurses and staff in the emergency room. So we created Corona Combat, um, which is a mobile game that takes its players on a fact-seeking, myth-busting journey, then provides them more information that is sourced through accurate websites such as WHO, CDC, UNICEF and others. It is known that information is paramount in tackling a crisis effectively, but not devoid of hope to keep the spirit of the fight. I wanted to say thank you for your commitments to action. Fighting this pandemic requires all of us, whether we are on the front lines as healthcare workers, support staff, or essential staff, whether we are staying at home to flatten the curve and protect our loved ones, or whether, like you, we are brainstorming ideas to make our community better. Your commitments to action matter. They make a difference. Thank you. 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 Stay safe, stay healthy, and act responsibly. Thank you so much. Now joining us, Chelsea Clinton, Vice Chair of the Clinton Foundation. Jenny Durkin, Mayor of Seattle. Dr. Paul Farmer, Co-Founder and Chief Strategist, Partners in Health. Dr. Syra Madad, Senior Director of the System-Wide Special Pathogens Program at New York City Health and Hospitals, and Christelle Quizera, Founder and Managing Director of Water Access Rwanda. Uh, well, good afternoon or good morning, good evening. Thank you all for being with us kind of for this panel talking about how we can learn from this COVID-19 crisis to build hopefully kind of more resilient health systems to help us respond to the crisis and to help us kind of ensure that we're moving forward on kind of public health, kind of health equity, um, patient health, and, and so much more into the future. And uh, we're just so grateful uh, for all of you taking your time uh, to be part of this conversation uh, and I really, uh, I want to start with you, uh, Mayor Durkan, because certainly kind of here in the United States, Seattle and Washington State kind of were uh, very much kind of among our first to experience COVID-19. And I think really what Seattle has achieved has been a, a model of, of responsiveness and, and really building resilience kind of into that response. So could you just tell us a little bit about kind of what's happening in Seattle today and um, kind of what you think? really has worked and, and what you'll yeah. kind of keep going Thank you, with Chelsea. even after um, this is waned? I think the first, the first lesson we learned is um, looking at the World Health Organization's recommendations was they had to speak with one government. And I think we've been able to accomplish what we've had as a city and a region because of the unified leadership from Governor Inslee to King County Executive Dow Constantine to other mayors here. And so really looking at what we have to do in concerted action, because we know that this virus does not respect any boundaries. 
I've also had the good fortune to be talking to mayors around the globe. Um, I'm part of C40, and so Eric Garcetti has convened those mayors um, from around the world on a, on a semi-regular basis now to learn lessons. So we were able to see the lessons that other cities across the world who experienced this first did and knew that we had very little tools. By the time we saw the virus erupt in our community, our researchers here, and we were very fortunate to have really good health researchers, told us that the number of cases we had actually was far understated. Um, and so working with them and getting the modeling to see that we really were past the stage where we could just do mitigation and contact tracing, we had to move immediately to shutting down parts of our society and our government. And in doing that, we, we knew that we had to do two things. One was, just as you said, to protect those who are most vulnerable in our communities and protect the healthcare system that would serve us. And second was to know that the, what we were doing um, was going to have a significant impact on those who were most economically um, marginalized. And so we did a dual track at the same time to one, flatten the curve, and so pretty quickly took steps to, to turn the dial to, to really do social distancing, shut down businesses, and we are very fortunate. Our modeling shows that we have passed the peak here and that we went from what was originally almost a, a, a rate of three that the virus was transmitting. So for every one person that had it, they would transmit it to three. Then now we're below one. And so we believe that we have flattened the curve. We're on the way down. But we know we have to keep this in place for still a significant period of time. And at the same time, how do we open up? So we looked really quickly at building that resilience, as you said, both in the healthcare system and those people most economically disadvantaged, to take some steps immediately to build in that resilience before the federal government could step in, making sure no one was evicted from their home, getting grocery, grocery vouchers in the hands of thousands of people, getting loans to small businesses, creating a uh, backbone to do food security. So we, we really worked hard to be thinking about who are the economically vulnerable as well and doing that in partnership with the community. And I think you have to think on both tracks at the same time. How do you protect the health of people, but also how do you protect the economic and social health as well? And you know, Dr. Madad, could you talk a little bit about kind of what we're seeing in New York City and really across New York State and kind of where we are today and kind of what you and everyone you're working with on the front lines is doing to try to help us uh, respond more effectively every day and also to be kind of more resilient in the future? So here in New York City, we're the epicenter of the epicenter and we're still battling combating COVID on while we may a current plateau, things can drastically change hour to hour, day by day. And Within this plateau, we are surging extremely high. This is obviously not a conventional setting uh, where we're practicing medicine that we normally do, uh, you know, when, when everything is, is all good and dandy. We're in a crisis situation. What that means and how that's translating to the front line is you know, the best example I can provide to show really the devastation that, that's happening uh, here in New York City is during, you know, conventional, um, you know, health care uh, practices right now there's a lot of you know um, discussion on N95s and so when you're using an N95 you dispose of it after caring for one patient but because of the crisis situation that we're in because of so many different factors like uh, you know impact to supply chain you're taking that same N95 not only are you extending the use of it of now caring for multiple patients but you're also reusing the same N95 because of supply chain issues. Um, and so currently here, obviously, at health and hospitals, everybody that requires personal protective equipment is given personal protective equipment. But knowing that our timeline, uh, you know, is hours, days, weeks, months, we're not exactly sure when we're going to be, you know, out of this uh, epidemic, we need to continue to have a lot of these resources injected within our supply chain. And so right now, you know, the frontline staff is doing an amazing job, you know, facing uh, COVID-19 head on. They have the resources that they need, but we need to continue to advocate for more resources. We also need to continue to advocate for their own well-being. You know, this is a devastating situation, uh, something that none of us have ever experienced before. We're learning so much, but we're also seeing the impact 
of this virus, not just on the healthcare system, but also on you know the the behavior and then the mental aspect of it all. And so there needs to obviously be a lot of support happening all around. You, know, Paul, you, I know um, you've seen kind of more. Uh, outbreaks and epidemics than probably you ever would have hoped to uh, in your career. Um, whether kind of it's the decades you've spent battling tuberculosis, HIV, malaria, or kind of being on the front lines of um, Ebola and now, you know, certainly with COVID-19. Could you talk a bit about kind of what you've learned kind of from Partners in Health's work in kind of Haiti, Liberia, Peru, really everywhere around the world and kind of what you think those lessons are that we need to be learning in Seattle, New York, and really everywhere here? Um, I, I just wanted to pick up on what the mayor and Dr. Madad said. I mean, they're describing two scenarios uh, where the idea was that, you know, it was urgent to, to attempt and prevent, uh, to attempt and flatten, flatten the curve. You know, and that was a term, you know, just last year, working with you on some writing projects, we were wondering, Chelsea, can we use terms like flattening the curve? Can we use terms like, you know, the peak of an epidemic? But now these are broadly understood, not just by our students and, and colleagues, but by everyone. And that must be a different situation for Dr. Madad as well. So just going back to this example, which isn't necessary for the speakers, but maybe for some in the audience, uh, in the situation in West Africa where a number of us, including Chelsea, were involved with the Ebola epidemic. The, uh, the, the efforts to prevent the surge failed. So between, let's just say, just to give some months, and again, this is a different uh, kind of virus, but still another RNA virus. In between, let's say, March, May of 2014, when it was full, first identified as Ebola virus and, and a particular kind of Ebola virus. In between then and the four or five months that followed, the surge was not prevented in either Liberia or Sierra Leone. And so what happened was the healthcare system was completely swept away. It had already been frail, it had already been weak, uh, but it was swept away. And in, in, in Guinea, it was, it was badly hit as well. Uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone, as you know, had gone through war not too long ago, and these kind of weakenings of healthcare systems tend to be involved in the more cataclysmic epidemics of at least the filoviruses. But it failed. Now, right now, the city of New York, uh, as Dr. Manad said, is the epicenter, and the city of Seattle, thank God, is already seeing its peak behind us, and we're all celebrating that. But if you want to get out of going up a peak, you know, a peak of cases, uh, you need to think, as has been done in Seattle and as, as is being done, I mean, one is reluctant to say anything. I'm in Boston, so very safe compared to Dr. Madad, just in terms of access to PPE and how many patients we have coming into the main teaching hospitals. But there, if, uh, if we look at how to uh, get down from that mountain, then te more testing, a lot more tracing, Isolation, which is the ideal, it was the ideal with whether it's Ebola or smallpox or, or uh, you know, Zika, uh, you know, some form of isolation, very different kinds of transmission, but some form of stopping that transmission. So te uh, uh, testing, uh, tracing, isolating. And then, you know, I, we can't forget, and certainly Dr. Uh, Madad and, and the mayor have not forgotten, and they won't forget in Rwanda either, that treatment is what people are looking at. It's not as if people come in and say, well, gee, I want to see the, the, uh, the epidemic flattened today. It's they're short of breath or someone they care is febrile or, or not eating. They want care. So the treatment part of testing, treating, and tracing is critical. And the message that you're getting out there, and I'm sure, again, the mayor has been doing this. I've seen her. And Dr. Madad has made a career out of this. It's saying, we got you. We're here to take care of you. This is not a new contact tracing initiative to, merely to stow people away and prevent them from transmitting, but also to help them face their symptoms. And that needs support because, as we know, and I, I, if I think about the places we've been together, Chelsea, 
you know, whether we're talking about a refugee camp or internally displaced persons camp or a tenement or a slum, uh, material, there is such a thing as it being material impossible or almost impossible to socially distance. So that support on top of those you know, testing, treating, testing, tracing, isolating, treating is really important. Now, the good news, and I'll stop here, and I'm sorry, forgive me, when I'm be, be in front of two people who are actually fighting this fight in New York and Seattle, but the way to get, avoid climbing up that mountain is that set of steps, but also the way to get down. So for whether we're in New York or Boston, we're trying to complement clinical efforts and the remarkable social distancing efforts of the population especially those who can socially dis distance themselves. We're trying to complement that with much more aggressive contact tracing. And forgive me for the, for the length of the comment, Chelsea. I just thought folks at CGIU well, would want to hear about it. No, thank you, Paul. And, and, I, and I want to um, kind of go back to the mayor, but, but first, you know, Christelle, since the mayor spoke kind of so movingly about what she is trying to do in, in Seattle in coordination with, with the governor and the county executive to ensure that um, people are not being made more vulnerable in this moment so that they have kind of social support, they have support for groceries, hopefully they have income support and other types of um, kind of support so that we're not making kind of the already vulnerable even more vulnerable in this moment. You know, that's the work that you're doing kind of on the front lines kind of in, in Rwanda uh, with your work with water. Could you talk a bit about kind of how you're responding to this COVID-19 moment and how your work has adapted to ensure that you're still helping people have access to clean, safe water? Um, thank you, Chelsea. Um, one of the things that hit us very quickly at Water Access Rwanda was the reality that um, most of our beneficiaries, our customers, could not social distance if we didn't get water to their household. So, um, as you know, most of the focus in rural Africa is to provide public access point for water. Uh, since 2017, our Water Access Rwanda, we wanted to provide access to water inside the home to save women time to walk. But suddenly, with the coronavirus uh, pandemic and the call for social distancing, uh, that was being pushed as one of the most effective way to stop the uh, crisis. Uh, most of our customers in rural areas could not social distance. They have to walk out of their homes to come and get water. They have to walk out of their homes sometimes to go access a toilet. They have to walk out of their homes uh, to go buy groceries and to go do um, uh, agricultural activities, which is one of their biggest sources of income. So we had already been on a drive to try and connect people in their homes but with the coronavirus coming, we really had to speed up efforts to make sure as many families as possible were allowed uh, what is really a luxury of being able to stay at home and open a tap and get water. It should be a human right, but unfortunately, in many rural African countries, it's a luxury. So uh, very, very real for us at the beginning of the crisis was how the solution we're offering was so important. Uh, but at the same time, we had to look at our public water points as potential contamination areas. So if you imagine, you know, we have all these pictures of people waiting in line to fill up their jerry cans, and usually that looks good, it's more customers for us. But suddenly when you look at it from the uh, standpoint of the disease spreading, all of those are people that can come to our kiosk, get safe water, and potentially go home with coronavirus. So we had to quickly implement uh, ways at the kiosk to enforce social distancing, make sure everybody who arrives washes their hands. And we had to do this within the reality that many people were panic buying um, and stocking up water because they didn't know, you know, am I going to be able to get out of the house to go get water again? So we had to collaborate with local authorities to be able to manage the water points. At the same time, it was my first time, um, I mean, it was the business's first crisis, really. Uh, and uh, we have field officers who have to keep operating so that uh, water doesn't run out. They can still fix issues happening. And uh, a lot of our shipments were stuck. We have a shipment stuck in the U.S., we have a shipment stuck in China, because there's not yet uh, a big local manufacturing uh, capacity. 
So we had to really become innovative in the different ways we're making sure the taps are still open because people need to hand wash. Uh, they need that water to still be able to go on with their lives. Water is life. Um, but at the same time, uh, Water Access Rwanda sees an opportunity within coronavirus, especially in the social awareness it's creating about wash, uh, water sanitation and hygiene. Uh, you know, diarrhea still kills a lot of people every day in the world. Um, I, I kind of, um, and forgive me, this is the entrepreneur in me seeing an opportunity in a crisis, but we always talk um, about, you know, wash your hands, prevent the spread of diarrhea, and now you see the public awareness to coronavirus, the same steps we're taking now to prevent the spread of coronavirus are the same steps you can take to uh, completely eliminate uh, waterborne diseases. Wash your hands, have clean water in your house, uh, make sure you avoid the spread of germs and so on. So we kind of, uh, we really like the public awareness he has created, but at the same time, it was a wake up call. It's doing a lot of advocacy work for us, saying that public points for rural areas should no longer be the standard. People need to have water in their homes. You know, and, and Mayor Durkan, I think that's a good kind of segue back to um, how you're thinking in Seattle about kind of what does come next. How do you kind of move forward um, kind of through this moment in a way that hopefully is um, not only kind of opening up, but not inviting kind of back kind of a, a new surge of, of COVID-19? Yeah. I think it's I think it's very complicated because you have to open not just locally but regionally and statewide and be looking at what other areas are doing because we are a, a country that travels and every new introduction of a virus in a community can cause an upswing like we've seen in Singapore. Um, the researchers believe that you know as much as eighty percent of the virus we have in our community came from a single transmission. So you have to be really grounded in the science and the health. And I think we have to do exactly what the professor was saying is we have to be able to do those things we didn't do that led to this crisis. We have to be able to identify who has the virus through very good testing. We have to be able to contact trace. We have to be able to isolate and quarantine. And so we have to have that structure in place where I think there's no one in the country right now that has that capability. We certainly don't have it in Seattle or in Washington state. And then on the other side, you have to be thinking, what are those sectors in the economy that you can reopen more safely so that you still limit the amount of transmission of the virus? And what are the social things you still have to do, whether it's wearing a mask or social distancing when you're not at work? All of these things, I think, have to work in conjunction. And I would just say, I mean, it's really, for me, it is really grounding to hear about Rwanda and the challenges they have, because I think that one of the things for me that has been so different about watching this pandemic develop is that you now have those nations um, in Europe and America and places that have been supporting some of the developing nations through the previous epidemics. And we are the ones now who are depleting the PPE, the, the vaccines, the testing materials. And we have to get to a, a status where we, we not only start to reopen our economies, we can build the resiliency in our countries and systems so we can continue in those roles that I think, you know, like the Clinton Global Initiatives and others have served for a very long time. So I think that while we've been very focused on Seattle and that's my job, that's what I do, we are also trying to be really thoughtful about what does that mean for the rest of the region, let alone rest of the world. You know, and, and I think, you know, Paul, if we can just kind of return to you for a moment and then would really appreciate uh, Dr. Madad's thoughts as well. You know, Paul, one of the things you and I have spoken about for so long really is the need for kind of global solidarity, not only because that is morally the right thing to do, but because it is in kind of all of our kind of health interests to do so. And I think we're seeing that so acutely kind of be true uh, at the moment. So uh, maybe you could just reflect on kind of how you're talking to people who maybe haven't understood how interconnected we all are, haven't understood kind of why we should care about kind of a new outbreak kind of in, in Wuhan more quickly, you know, maybe don't understand kind of how interconnected all of our 
kind of medical supply chains are in the way that Dr. Madad was talking about. Just how are you trying to help, whether it be your students or your colleagues or or the public, understand um, kind of how reliant we really are on one another and why recognizing that reliance has to be part of building resilience. You know, I um, I was just reading a piece by uh, a medical historian. It was really she was writing, her name's Nancy Tomes, and she was writing in an academic journal uh, at the time of a H1N1 outbreak in 2009 that went into 2010. I'm sure Dr. Madad uh, was already involved in her in her efforts to, to slow that virus down, if memory serves. So um, she was saying that uh, there's more of a chance now that the population, the lay population, will understand the need to adopt measures like social distancing. And again, if I'd read that paper carefully when she wrote it a, a decade ago, I'm not sure if I would have, I think I would have said, well, maybe maybe the American people will, will do this, maybe they won't. But I, I would, I'm not sure I would have bet that we'd have uh, ready adherence to some pretty dramatic, like what the mayor is talking about, some very dramatic interventions. And yet we have seen uh, a broad array of the populace uh, comply uh, very impression impressively with these requests, and the ones who can't can't. I mean, they 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 often it's not some cultural distinct distinction that has people of color at greater risk in New York or Louisiana or or uh, or in Chicago and around Illinois. It's not some cultural to say nothing of a genetic kind of risk. It's social disparities of risk and social disparities of risk of other chronic illnesses. So just going back to having how young people can get involved, and I, I got caught out of a little bit about this. One of some of the measures that we're proposing, um, you know, here in Massachusetts that have been done in Seattle, um, have already involved a lot of uh, students, public health students, medical students. We have the medical students here signing up to begin their clinical duties early. I think we see all around us a willingness to take action and I'm just hoping that uh, we're going to form find more ways uh, in which people can do so because the social support part of this is is critical. It's um, helping people know where they're going to be safe and where their family members are going to be safe. And then we'll find a lot of people will line up with our recommendations for public health responses, including social distancing. And Dr. Madad, one of the things I know you've been so uh, attentive to. Uh, are the ways in which COVID-19 has preyed on our structural inequities and inequalities, you know, as, as Paul was just, you know, talking about not only in New York City, but kind of in Illinois and Louisiana, really everywhere. Could you talk about kind of what New York City is trying to do to kind of uh, recognize that and, and respond uh, to the ways in which COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting um, not only kind of our elderly people with underlying conditions, but also kind of um, Black and Latinos in New York City. Uh, I think, you know, COVID-19 is not just obviously uh, an infectious disease outbreak that's preying on health uh, and healthcare systems. It's actually amplifying, you know, socioeconomic inequalities and health disparities we have across the city, across the state, across the nation. Um, you know, we're seeing obviously a lot of health disparities between African Americans here, also in New York City, Latinos. Um, and it's extremely unfortunate. There's a lot of underlying causes uh, to that. And, you know, we need to address these underlying causes if we want to better respond better to these types of epidemics in the future. Uh, and this obviously includes looking at the socioeconomic, socioeconomic factors that go into the social determinants of, of health. Um, so some of the things that we're seeing here in New York City um, one of the things that came out very early on was, you know, one of our hospitals in New York City Health and Hospitals, Elmhurst, um, that was disproportionately overwhelmed with COVID-19 patients early on and even now as we're still battling this um, epidemic. And it was by no accident, no surprise that this particular hospital in that particular borough of Queens uh, was so heavily impacted. And what, if you look at the underlying causes, that particular borough is one of the most diverse urban centers, uh, diverse urban centers in the United States, and it has a very large immigrant population. Have a lot of you know, um, you know, Latinos there as well as a lot of African Americans. And if you 
to, you know, dig deeper, you're seeing that, you know, a lot of these individuals, when we talk about social distancing and keeping six feet away, a lot of them live in homes that are multi-generational. They have a lot of people living in under one roof, so it's very hard to socially distance one another. And on top of that, a lot of these people hold, you know, these essential jobs that we talk about, you know, are they're uh, are the individuals that are, you know, in, in the grocery stores, you know, and, you know, driving taxis, things like that. And so it's putting them at higher risk. And so when we talk about battling and contracting an outbreak and what we can learn from, you know, and applying it to future uh, instances, we really need to look at some of these underlying causes. Another thing to also look at, it's something that may not even, you know, people may not even think about, is just um, paid sick leave. You know, so if you're in a job that does not have paid sick leave and you need to put food on the table, uh, then you're going, then you're forced to, to go out and obviously if you're infected, expose additional people because you need to make money. And so they don't have that paid sick leave that a lot of other countries may offer. And so it's basically exposing a lot of these different issues. And so if we want to really address, you know, this one that we're currently in, we need to look at some of the underlying problems that are bubbling up. And, you know, my list can on and on uh, in terms of some of the other issues that we're seeing, you know, play out with, with health disparity, not just obviously those that have comorbidities. The other issue is, you know, in the United States, we have a huge obesity epidemic. And what you're actually seeing uh, in the front lines is that actually is playing a very large role in your overall um, outcome in terms of your, your case, you know, how severe your case is. And so because of this obesity epidemic and as well as some other health issues that we have here in the United States, that is also you know, um, tied to some of the, the uh, you know, depending on what race and ethnicity you are, you're at higher chances of having a worse outcome. And so we need to make sure that we have better systems in place, a better safety net system that can help work through a lot of these issues that we're seeing. Thank you, Dr. Madad. You know, I certainly um, agree that, that we are decades past needing not only universal health insurance in our country, but also universal paid sick leave and so many other um, aspects of the social safety net that hopefully will help kind of protect uh, not only kind of everyone that you're seeing kind of as patients in uh, in hospitals today, but ultimately public health more broadly. And, you know, uh, Mayor Durkan, I, I was struck listening to Dr. Madad earlier talking about kind of the challenges with PPE, with personal protective equipment on the front lines, and then also now, given the universal recommendations of wearing masks, you know, could you just talk a little bit about what Seattle is doing to try to have kind of clear messaging around kind of what people should be doing now to protect themselves and to kind of be good citizens? Kind of what are you doing to try to ensure that frontline workers have access to, to PPE and kind of just what else kind of are you doing to still respond to COVID-19, even though you're hopefully kind of coming down the curve? Yeah, I think, Chelsea, you've really touched on um, some really important things. I don't know how many mayors knew what PPE was before February 28th, and I can guarantee you every mayor in the nation knows it now. Um, we created, we had to create a Seattle hotline and tool to try to gather PPE from closed clinics, closed dental offices and the like, just to get enough PPE for our healthcare workers because we were burning through it so quickly and we could not get it from the national stockpile. So we have, we've gotten to a point now where we believe we have enough in our hospital capacity right now because we passed the peak. We have enough both personnel, beds, ventilators, and PPE. But we also know we're going to need more of that going forward. So we found that the, probably the best messengers for people to do the hard things they're doing right now are those frontline healthcare workers that we all, all see working around the clock in some of the most brutal conditions serving patients dozens at a time, going in themselves day after day, exposing themselves. And I, I think the people of Seattle have done really well. I think that um, it, it was, I think, remarkable that we all looked at Wuhan early on and thought, you'll never get that kind of shutdown in America. But yet we've done it. We've come very close where we've closed down almost all businesses. People are socially distancing. I will say people are starting to get a little restless. And I think it overlaps with the fact that the economics from the federal government have not kicked in. And so people are desperate. We started a rental assistance program that we had to almost shut down within, you know, a few days because we had so many more thousands of people apply than we had assistance for. 
So I think our ability to send the message to stay safe has landed well. But for example, last weekend we had to close our parks because we'd seen more and more people coming out trying to get the fresh air, but gathering, having barbecues, very crowded situations. And so we are still exercising that dial to make sure that we don't lose all of the gains that we've made because people have sacrificed so much to get to where we are. And I think that, that when people hear that and think about it in those terms, they're willing to keep doing the hard things. Um, we are, we are going to emphasize coming up people wearing masks when they go out. Um, that is a strong recommendation from the CDC. It's not required yet in any Washington state city, but we're talking about making it required because we know as we move to the next phase, because as we will have not enough testing, we have to do everything we can to protect people when they are out. You know, and Paul and Christelle, you know, just a, a question really building on something that, that Christelle mentioned earlier and, and Paul, that you and I have talked about for a long time, the ways in which um, kind of outbreaks and epidemics um, are especially dangerous for women. You know, although kind of COVID-19 seems to be um, kind of hitting men hardest in some ways, um, we know that kind of outbreaks prey on kind of the normal pathways of care and that so many caregivers are, are women whether that's kind of caregiving in the home or kind of what Christelle was talking about, the caregiving of going out to seek water every day. You know, and Dr. Madad spoke about kind of the ways in which COVID-19 is hitting kind of black Americans and Latino Americans so painfully hard in, in New York City and, and really around the country. But, you know, Paul and Christelle, could you talk about kind of what messages we really need to be kind of delivering, especially to uh, women caregivers, you know, whether in Rwanda or, or Haiti, Paul, in Boston, really? Really anywhere, and, and Paul, maybe you can you can speak, and then and then Christelle. In a way that we did not, uh, as the mayor said, we did not know just a few months ago. This is a caregiver's disease. It's going to affect caregivers disproportionately. We know what that looks like from Ebola, also a caregiver's disease that not spread by the respiratory route, but um, again in the course of taking care of your loved ones uh, or in the final act of caregiving, which in most religious traditions is burial, respectful burial, burial of the dead. So I think we're going to see these same risks. Who are our caregivers? Who are our frontline workers? Uh, are they well supported? Um, uh, again, you know, just a few years ago, we might not have had such an easy time advancing a discussion about universal health care and you know uh, disability insurance and unemployment insurance and as dr madad said these are uh well these have uh, hove into view as clear cofactors for poor outcomes for many of our uh, those most most at risk so i'm hoping as you are chelsea and, and i know christelle is too that we can have a broader discussion when the time is right about what our societies have looked like the reason that we are borrowing from Rwanda and learning from Rwanda in the middle of this crisis is following their crisis. They spent years doing soul searching and had to address questions, including who should be in, have health insurance. And, and I was living there at the time, and I'm embarrassed to say that I thought, uh, you know, this was about 2002. I thought they're never going to pull this off. They're never going to have a health insurance that, that really reaches the vulnerable. And that was incorrect, because if you believe that will never come to pass, you'll be a, a prophet for sure. So I'm, I'm counting on us learning from Rwanda a lot of messages that I think would be useful in New York and Seattle and plenty of other places as well. And, and Christelle, either I feel like I react. Preaching. Oh. Well, you can always preach. So either reactions to what Paul said or kind of the questions I raised. Yeah, for me, I think one uh, one thing that really came to the surface is how uh, the overall condition of women or the realities of many women, especially in um, um, in vulnerable areas and groups, have really become worse because of uh, coronavirus. Uh, for example, you know, every time I log on to social media, uh, everywhere in the world there is a higher report of um, uh, cases of gender-based violence and. Um, sexual harassment, sexual assault uh, by family members, things like that. Uh, but at the same time, as you touched on, women are um, the caregivers. They are the ones who spend 
a lot of time taking care, uh, doing unpaid domestic work. Uh, and for me, the biggest focus is water, of course, which, um, as the numbers estimate, uh, women globally lose 40 billion hours a year just working for water. Uh, something that could easily be piped, for, piped to them, um, uh, just a matter of infrastructure. So um, it's been quite, um, as a woman myself, you know, to see that staying in the home uh, also brings danger to other women. Uh, I hope really as this ends, we also have more courage and more drive to address the issues that uh, make homes unsafe for women or a place of suffering for women instead of being a place of, um, you know, uh, relaxation or a place where they can stay in to feel safe. Um, because we're staying home to be safe, but some women um, are staying home and uh, having their condition exasperated and actually putting themselves in danger. So that's what I could add. Um, can I, um, really, can I, I add one, one thing, Crystal? Just... Um, just to add to, to something, I uh, and I may have mit missed it, Christelle may have said it, but, you know, Rwanda offers other lessons, of course, and it's not an accident, as Christelle may have, Chris Christelle may have said when I was off, that Rwanda has the highest uh, fraction of women parliamentarians. And, I, and, and you know, Mayor Durkin is, is, I think, the first woman mayor of Seattle, and, you know, uh, Let's let's be aware. At least I am, as the only guy on the phone, uh, that you know when we when we lose out on um, women in positions of leadership, we also lose out on uh, innovations that are going to make us all uh, safer and make a caregiver's disease have less of a burden on the caregiver. So, um, I, I, in case no one else said it. Yeah, one of the best things has been to see how all the women leaders across the world are really stepping up and leading this, you know, like the bosses they are. So it's been quite, I've been quite the fun girl watching and, you know, trying to do my best with uh, my team of a few people here in Rwanda. So uh, it's quite, uh, women really are running the show uh, in a beautiful way. And I think Chelsea, Sorry, if I might up. add to there's a there's a health well-being um, part that while women aren't the as disproportionately the victims of the virus, I think there's going to be some long-term mental health and and fatigue issues that women are, are still shouldering more than others, not just the domestic violence, which we touched upon, but, you know, so many women who, who were in the workforce, as soon as our schools shut down and people are working from home. They are doing childcare. Sometimes they're caring for adults and seniors. They're trying to do their job. And so they're playing all those roles and they're disproportionately the healthcare workers. So I think that society still has not caught up to the, to the wellness that women are going to need, particularly coming through this pandemic. Yes, I completely agree. Um, and in our final few minutes, you know, as I think all of you know, um, you know, CGI University, you know, had we been able to meet uh, this time in person, would have had more than 800 students from more than 100 universities in almost as many countries around the world. And so just as you think about kind of that audience, uh, what do you want young people to know? And um, if you had advice for how young people could engage, would that be to kind of sign up as contact tracers? Is that to check on their neighbors? Is that to ensure they're being gentle to themselves, kind of to Mayor Durkin's point? kind of reaching out for whatever kind of help we all may need in this moment of uncertainty and also reaching out to help in this moment of uncertainty. Just any kind of advice or suggestions um, I think would be really appreciated by our students. And um, maybe, um, Christelle, we'll start with you since you were a CGIU student and then we'll kind of go around my screen. So kind of Christelle, Paul, Dr. Madad, and then, and then Mayor Durkan. Yeah. Um I was, uh, my business was actually a few months old when I attended CGIU. I founded it one year before I graduated. Um, and I guess it's kind of, you know, it's been five years in the making, but being able to address this crisis in a real way, you know, providing uh, something like water, hand washing stations that are really uh, now big uh, healthcare commodities um, uh, has been quite exciting and, you know, a good result for the work we've been doing. But the advice I would have for students uh, watching right now is 
to try all they can do and not wait. Um, um, I don't know how to phrase it the right way, but the skills and talents they already have right now are enough to contribute to something real and tangible that can have great results. So from, um, you know, I've been looking at examples of other young people around the world, from those delivering groceries to the elderly, um, uh, to those who are um, uh, helping with the social distancing by doing live shows uh, every day on social media. So there is all kinds of ways young people can really take leadership and contribute to the efforts of what's happening. We need to be aware as young people. But the other uh, part of the puzzle is to look forward uh, to the world after COVID-19, to the aftermath. What are the opportunities that coronavirus is opening up? Uh, how does the world need to be after coronavirus? What lessons are we learning as young people to deal with the next pandemic? So those are all uh, social entrepreneurship opportunities opening up. So anybody thinking of a solution right now, step up. You know, I've seen many people release apps to help with data tracking. And, you know, you, you do that in one night. So that's the power of young people. So keep it up. Whatever you're able to contribute, do it. There is nothing too small and look at the aftermath, uh, because there is opportunities opening up. Great. Thank you, Christophe. Paul? Well, I'm going to just, you know, like in the hospital, Dr. Madal will remember this when you, when the attending, the senior physician writes a little note, says agree with the above, so he or she doesn't have to write a long note. I agree with everything you said, Christelle, and I have a hunch that I'm going to agree with the, with Dr. Madad and the mayor and you. So I, I want to, can I say something a little bit negative just for young people to be aware of? You know, this term resilience has a scary side to it too, right? We're, when I think about some of the conditions that Dr. Madad is fa facing and that we will in our clinical work, um, I mean, ex exposing frontline workers, whether firefighters or nurses, uh, to heavy and sustained doses of COVID-19 or whatever the virus is not showing anything about resilience, you know, and if you're not giving them enough PPE, how can they be re resilient? How can people in refugee camps and slums to practice social distancing? So, so social distancing. So here's the challenge. Since I already work with students and everything I do, I've never had any good experience without working with students and believe that they can do everything that we've described. Just be careful when you hear people talking about resilience as if it would be reflected in the middle of an earthquake in Haiti when a building falls on someone. You know, we've got we to gotta remember that the only thing that makes something resilient is community. It's all of us working together. It's a city coming together. It's a Department of Public Health coming together. It's a neighborhood coming together around water. So I'm going to keep saying it. There is no resilience without the we part. And, uh, and in studying why we fail, for example, how do we fail women who are cooped up in cramped apartments for unexpected weeks? We'll find out. And then the resilience part is what we do collectively to turn to the most vulnerable. Again and again, it's serving the most vulnerable that we need everybody engaged in. Dr. Madad. So, I mean, uh, what has already been said, but a couple of things I'd like to add to the conversation is there's a lot of work to be done. And these types of situations require an all hands on deck approach. So we want to make sure that people are still investing in going into science and technology, research and development. Some of the things that you're seeing come out here in New York City because of some of the significant impacts and issues, you know, supply chain. Um, you know, our workforce, you see these wartime factories now popping up. So, you know, you're seeing a lot of individuals now converting their, you know, um, their shops into developing face shields, developing isolation gowns, things like that. And so there's a role to play for every single person. So whether you're a student, whether you're a polished or seasoned, you know, healthcare professional, you know, whether you're a clerk, you know, in a grocery store, all of us, you know, have a, a role to play. Um, and we need to make sure that we understand what are the needs and how we can meet those needs. And right now, you know, we're in a crisis situation, so the need is much, much greater. But we also need to look at after this crisis is done, what can we do to make sure we learn the lessons from this current crisis and we're in a better position for the future, you know, events that are going to come down uh, in the pipeline. We know that it's inevitable. They are going to occur. And so, you know, students 
uh, play an extremely large role in helping look into some of the aspects that we have experienced and then investing in some of these careers uh, that will help combat the next pandemic that we're going to face. And obviously, you know, just in the, in the last decade, we faced a number of different infectious disease outbreaks, whether it's Zika, Ebola, measles, New York, New York City obviously just, you know, overcame this, uh, you know, a huge measles outbreak. One of the things that we experienced, not just combating the actual outbreak itself, but this contagion of misinformation. And so, you know, with students, you know, we want to make sure that people are getting informed, educating themselves, knowing where to go to, and then helping the community understand some of these basic facts. And so, you know, when we talk about these health disparities earlier, you know, if, you know, you're coming from a background where, you know, people will need more information because they don't understand what the public health guidance is, playing a role and providing, you know, accurate and, and trustworthy information to these individuals. And so all of us play a role in this. It's not just the healthcare workers. It's not just the elected officials. Every single one of us has a role to play in outbreak response. And yet we, we do know that elected officials uh, really matter. So Mayor Durkan, to give you the last word, kind of what would you say to young people kind of in Seattle, but really uh, anywhere in the world about kind of what you would hope um, they would be doing, that they would be thinking about what they could do like now in the future uh, to respond to COVID-19, uh, but also to um, what we've heard before, um, help us be more resilient for the next time. So Chelsea, I, I will say that everyone, what we said, what we can do to get through this, I agree that young people can help carry us through this. And we've all seen the tragedy play out on a family by family basis, a community basis across the globe. Um, and it's, you know, the word unprecedented is used so many times, and this is an unprecedented event in history. But I think the thing that would be most tragic is if we did not learn the lessons that we have, that we've seen here, the inequities that we've seen play out through this pandemic. And that's what the young people are going to have to do most, your students and students across the world, to make sure that as we come out and we rebuild society by society, that they are the force that makes sure that all of these inequities that we see now in glaring relief, that we actually do something about them going forward. And that will only hap with, happen with the activism and energy that we've seen the youth do like in climate um, and other areas. And so my urging is help all you can through this, but we are now in a world marathon where we really have to reshape who we are as a society across the globe. I completely agree. Well, hopefully everyone listening will be part of that marathon. Um, thank you, all of you, for everything that you're doing. Thank you for your time um, this afternoon, or whether maybe it's this morning or this evening. And we're all incredibly, incredibly uh, grateful. So stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you all. I'm Katrina Velasquez-Neros, and the future is fighting for human rights. The future is fighting the opioid epidemic. The future is fighting climate change. And protecting natural resources. Tackling domestic violence. It's empowering refugee women. Zero discrimination and equal job opportunities for everyone. It's equitable access to education. Tackling substance abuse. The disaster resilient world. The future is empowering the next generation of leaders. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, on this panel, we're joined by three remarkable American public servants. Uh, Representative Karen Bass from California is the head of the Congressional Black Caucus and has a strong background in health care herself. Uh, Representative Joaquin Castro from San Antonio is the chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and has been very involved in these issues. And Dr. Eric Goosby from the University of California in San Francisco is one of America, one of the world's most renowned public health doctors. He is the United Nations Special Envoy on Tuberculosis. He was President Obama's head of the PEPFAR program in mm -hmm. President Obama's first term. And as I was just telling the other participants, in 2002, he was my partner when uh, what is now the Clinton Health Access Initiative began our work ironically in China when we were trying to help rural people in China uh, stem what was rapidly becoming an epidemic unaddressed as well as deal with the traditional uh, urban problems of AIDS all those years ago. So we've been friends a long time. 
And these three people, I think, are in a real strong position to answer questions about the racial and economic disparities of this pandemic uh, in the American population and things that we ought to be looking for as the problem spread to other countries across the globe. Uh, I'd like to begin with uh, Dr. Goolsby and ask the obvious question, why do we have racial disparities in the both the infection rate and the death rate uh, of the coronavirus in the United States? Well, thank you, Mr. President. It's a real uh, pleasure and honor to have an opportunity to speak to this issue. I think you're correct in convening this discussion. I think that what we unfortunately continue to see is a uncovering of the disparities in both availability of medical care and services and our ability to retain patients in care over the duration of time to accurately diagnose and initiate treatments that correct um, chronic progressive diseases in the African-American community. And I think the COVID outbreak, as has happened so many times in the past with other outbreaks such as HIV, shows a disproportionate impact on those individuals who are not part of the medical delivery system and carry with them an inability to access medical information and services um, quickly, easily, in a, in a manner that allows for uh, work and activities of daily living to continue. You name the disease, hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, respiratory infections, asthma, et cetera, all play out more negatively in the African-American population. And this is a disparity that has been present for as long as I've practiced medicine and long before. I think it stems from a complex interplay of lack of socioeconomic equity that is institutionalized and manifests itself in everything from our ability to identify, enter, and retain individuals in care. And that inability to do that over time impacts differently on populations. And unfortunately, the COVID has shown us once again that African-American communities are the target. Karen? Well, uh, I certainly agree with everything that the doctor has said, uh, but I would also include in there um, the unconscious bias of health professionals because you can look at some disorders and you can see the disparity that exists across socioeconomic status in the African-American population. And one that we're dealing with right now is a real increase in mater maternal mortality, which is something that is difficult to reconcile in 2020 in the United States, that maternal mortality would be a problem and that it would be disproportionate, and it is disproportionate across socioeconomic status. Well, we just had a painful example of that in New York in the last week, and I don't, I'm not saying there was any racial motivation behind it, but a 33-year-old African-American man who was very overweight but was also a responsible worker and a father was in the hospital, not tested because we didn't have enough testing equipment, and they thought he just had a bad cold, and three days later he dropped dead, uh, leaving a widow and young children. So uh, we're seeing that here. Joaquin, would you like to say anything before we go? Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for convening this discussion, uh, an absolutely important one in the middle of this pandemic in our nation, the wealthiest nation on earth. Um, but what this has exposed is some very longstanding inequities and challenges in our American mm -hmm. society. And we see both the African-American population very hard hit and Latinos in different parts of the country also uh, devastated. In New York, for example, uh, Latinos uh, are, account for 34 percent of the deaths uh, because of COVID-19. In my hometown of San Antonio, the African-American population is 7 or 8 percent 
but African Americans account for 36 percent of the deaths. Uh, and so uh, the numbers, uh, we just seen different regions that have reported numbers. We have asked the CDC to produce comprehensive data on to so, so that we can see exactly what's going on. Uh, but uh, obviously, uh, it speaks to many of the failings in our healthcare system and other parts of our society that we absolutely need to address. I agree with that. I want to ask you one thing, though, I, I noticed because I checked the population composition against the death rates in several American cities. And mm -hmm. interestingly enough, even though there's a disparity in New York, and there's a, the gap between the population and the death rate is smaller in New York and California than it is in many other states. You know, in Louisiana, uh, the population is 30% African American and the deaths are 70%. Same in a lot of the Middle Western cities. So what do you think the difference is in the disparity? Why is there so much difference in some areas and others? Eric? Well, yeah, let me take a shot at that, Mr. President. I think it's, again, a multifactorial reason that African Americans and Hispanic communities in San Francisco and in Oakland, the East Bay, were seeing a disproportionate number of Hispanics falling to both cases and deaths. So we see that similar, a similar picture that you're, that you're seeing in Texas. I think um, communities that have jobs that are people facing, uh, interact with the public, uh, uh, lower um, paid jobs that start often as uh, clerical, uh, where you're interfacing with public uh, in um, transportation settings as well disproportionately uh, occupied by uh, African-American, Hispanic uh, people. And that fact puts um, our communities in front of a threat that those that are not uh, forced to do that are not put in front of. Uh, and I think um, the inability to, uh, again, access and be retained in care plays out for all chronic progressive diseases uh, and in acute outbreaks uh, because of a similar need to identify, enter, and retain people quickly. Anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah, I also think um, that you have clusters of both African Americans and Latinos in states that have not set up the best infrastructure of opportunity uh, for access to health care, for example. Uh, Texas, my home state, has the highest percentage of people that have no health care coverage at all. And the state is about 12, 13 percent African-American and about 40 percent Latino. Uh, so you have a lot of folks who are in places. Florida is another example that hasn't expanded Medicaid. Texas hasn't expanded Medicaid. Other southern states as well. You mentioned the difference between a New York and the South. Uh, I think that that's got to account for at least part of that equation. And if you look at California, where the rates are still disproportionate, I mean, in Los Angeles, African-Americans are 9% of the uh, city and the county, but 19% of the death rate. But still, California, the resources are much better. The commitment here, uh, the commitment here to provide uh, resources to the entire population, including the undocumented population, I think uh, has been helpful. But the dip disparity is still there. I do too. I isn't the uh, the insured rate in California is well over ninety five percent, isn't it? It's up to ninety. I don't know if it's quite. I don't know if it's quite that high, but it is high. It is absolutely very high because of the commitment. I mean, we're we're very fortunate. I tell that to uh, my Californians all the time. <laughs> well, when we get this, when you get this in hand, I think that you can use that to really put the heat on these other states to expand. Medicaid, right. because there's no question that the absence of an underlying health network has contributed to the death rate among but, but, low-income working people disproportionately concentrated in African Americans and Hispanics. But Mr. President, some of those same southern states are the ones that reject the public health guidelines, <laughs> you know, I in know terms that. of staying at home I and all. That, but I it's think, just uh, incredible. You know, 
I feel badly because Louisiana finally got a governor that would take right. the Medicaid expansion, <laughs> but he hadn't had time to have it in place long enough. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I, a lot of what happened in New Orleans was because of Mardi Gras, I think, but still right. the, we've got to recognize that the health system itself has got to be built up. I, I wanted to ask you one other thing, all three of you, about something that doesn't directly affect you. Uh, I noticed, and there may be a lot more going on, but I know that in Northern California, there's a preliminary effort to do contact tracing. Yes, uh, Mr. President. Uh, 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 excuse me. So Go ahead. Go ahead. Let me finish the question. Paul Farmer, the head of Partners in Health, he's a good friend of Eric's and mine and serves on the board of our health initiative, is heading up from Massachusetts an attempt to do contact tracing for the whole state. They don't have the people to do it now because we haven't built out the public health network at the community level we need. If they, if they had all the people they need tomorrow, they don't necessarily have all the protective gear they need for these people to go and do the personal interface. But it's a good beginning. And if we want to put America's economy back on, we got to be able to test millions more people. we got to be able to take millions of people's temperature every day. And we've got to have workers that can be protected while they're doing this work. So I, I just wanted to say that because I think you're going to face uh, all these requests for more money. But if we don't have a public health network that will stand up while people are beginning to go back to work, we're going to have all these problems flare up again. Right. So, well, I, I would uh, really strongly agree with everything you said, Mr. President. I think that uh, that is the bottom line, and it, I think, behooves all of us to understand those relationships and to ask of our political leadership uh, that they um, focus on responding to this long-term unmet need. I just wanted to mention um, one of the other confounders as to why there's a disproportionate impact in both um, our Hispanic and African American uh, populations with the COVID-19 is because of the propensity to uh, have a more rapid uh, course uh, from exposure to infection and to move from infection to serious illness more rapidly. Most, as you mentioned, uh, who have comorbidities. People with congestive heart failure, with coronary artery disease, with asthma, and with diabetes have a disproportionate um, sensitivity to this coronavirus's ability to attach and intercalate its RNA into the cytoplasm of your cells. It attaches more efficiently. As a result, for the same exposure, more people exposed in the same way with those underlying diseases are more likely to incur an infection. And I believe that that is a major motor to favor um, uh, black and Hispanic uh, communities. And, and we are indeed seeing this everywhere. So what can we do through the Congress or elsewhere yeah. to minimize it going forward? So let, let me just mention that uh, uh, on behalf of the Black Caucus, there are very specific things that we are proposing. And uh, we're proposing right now concentrated focus testing where you have large concentrations of African-Americans and are a disproportionate death rate. What I'm concerned about now is that there's a lot of attention on the comorbidity and uh, also on the individual behavior of African-Americans, which to me just amounts to blaming the victim. But I think we need to do focus testing. We need to do the contact tracing. We need to make sure the testing, the results are back rapidly. I've talked to doctors where it takes seven to 10 days. We also need the antibody tests. And then we need to have resources that go directly to community-based organizations so that people can involve, be involved in the education work that needs to, uh, to take place. I'm concerned that with the focus on the underlying health issues, that it then becomes an excuse to basically say, well, there's nothing we can do about it because you guys have all these health issues and, uh, and, and the situation is ignored. Joaquin? Yeah, we also support an aggressive outreach model. You talked about contact tracing. In many places in Texas, they stopped doing that and moved to a mitigation model uh, after 
the different localities felt like uh, there were a number of cases that involved community spread. A lot of them stopped the tracing. Uh, and so we've got to do that aggressively. We've got to test aggressively. Uh, in the Latino community, for example, you have, uh, of course, overwhelming number of Latinos in the United States are citizens, but you also have folks that are undocumented and are legal permanent residents. And some of them are fearful of getting tested, either because they don't know whether that's going to affect their their status or their ability to remain in the country. Or uh, I have heard stories now of people who are simply afraid of the cost. Uh, they're afraid. They're, it's almost like a, uh, you know, a see no evil, hear no evil, where they don't want to avail themselves of the medical procedures because they're fearful of a multi-thousand dollars in bills that's going to come to them. Um, I'm also concerned that governors across the country uh, are not aggressively testing at this point because they don't want to be the face of this pandemic. They don't want to be on the news every night the way that New York is. Uh, and so uh, they're hoping that they can ride this thing out. And it's clear that the communities that are paying the highest price for that are often low-income communities and, and Black and Latino communities in the country. Can I mention a couple of other Sure. Things. Well, one, uh, I'm concerned about the people who are incarcerated, and I also think of the detention centers. And for, uh, well, we are calling for the early release of people, but I don't want to see people just released into the community unless they're tested and, and you know, we're uh, aware of that. Um, the So I think that we have to think about that as well, as well as protective um, uh, protective uh, gear for folks who are the essential workers. Uh, and then the data, we need to have the data, because right now the death rate is basically anecdotal. Uh, the CDC is either, and the doctor might know about this, is either not taking the, um, or not compiling the data, or they're not disseminating it. But we definitely need to have it, to have the data. So we know what we're yes. dealing with. And not just the death rate, the infection rate, hospitalization, et cetera, the whole picture. You're absolutely right, Congresswoman, um, and I, I really didn't want to imply with the comorbidities that that was some explanation for why African-American and Hispanic communities were uh, disproportionately impacted. It nevertheless, though, is a reality that the healthcare delivery system and our country's leadership needs to understand that disparity how that's a deeply rooted disparity that precludes our ability to rapidly respond to a new threat such as a COVID-19. Uh, and that underlying lack of, of healthcare delivery interface with a population has got to be addressed for us as we move back into changing our mitigation strategies, the case finding and, and uh, contact tracing becomes the only tool we have to uh, balance back transmission threats while we put people together more frequently and in larger number. So I strongly agree that the testing is critical. It will enable us to be rational about who we put back in group connection, who we allow to go back and be a doctor or a nurse in a hospital setting, or go back to work knowing that they indeed have had the infection and they've moved through it and developed antibodies. I also want to say that it's more complicated than that because we don't know yet if these antibodies afford any protection right. for subsequent right. exposure. And so we are assuming that that is indeed how it will work. It's hope we're hopeful and likely, but I've practiced long enough to know that some viruses don't do that at all. You can make HIV is a wonderful example of a lot of antibodies that don't do anything, and you can get reinfected and reinfected with the same with the same virus. So the science needs to move rapidly. We need, we need to acknowledge, embrace, and accept the fact that the disparities we have in communities' reaction to this pandemic are largely dependent on the healthcare delivery system's ability to mount a response. If you're not interfaced with that community, you will not be able to change slopes of ascent and accelerate slopes of decline. That 
manage is managed best by community-based organizations that are already well interfaced with the populations of interest. In this case, Hispanics, African Americans uh, have credibility, are trusted, and we need, as the public health system, to take advantage of that interface already established and expand the capacity of community-based organizations that can take on screening, testing, referral, triage, et cetera, uh, during this uh, emergent need. Well, let's talk about uh, the two things. First of all, the need to go back and do contact tracing in the communities. And second, uh, let's deal with the issue that uh, Representative Bass raised about the incarcerated population. There are approximately uh, 400 people at Rikers Island in New York alone Right. Who are there because they can't post bail. They mm -hmm. haven't been convicted of anything. And right. we know from the people who've been released so far that 86% of them show up for their first bail hearing. And if you give them uh, a second notice, 93% do. So depending on what they're being held, they're obviously if they're not bail, it probably the offense is not super serious and they can't make bail. Don't we need a system which will enable, first of all, these uh, prisons to have as much reasonable separation as possible, so you gotta reduce the population, and to, to feel free letting people go, but as you pointed out, they have to be tested, and then they have to have some place to go. You don't wanna send exactly. them to a place that's infested with the virus. So is there a special program that funds those efforts in any of these bills? And if not, should there be? And can we create a national movement which will make uh, all these governors and administrators feel more comfortable with this? This is uh, even New York, which has adopted a real sweeping bail reform measure, still has 400 people in Rikers who can't, pay their, can't post bail. So we've got to figure out how to do this nationwide. And that we could, I'm, I've been amazed that more people haven't died in prisons already. Well, I, I, we'll see, because I think the numbers are going to uh, be quite explosive. Well, one of the things the Congressional Black Caucus pushed for, we, we didn't succeed this last time, but we're gonna continue trying, is at the same time as we're calling for uh, early release for, in a number of categories. For example, pregnant women shouldn't be in jail. Uh, you mentioned bail. There's also people that are in jail and prison because of technical violations. They didn't show up for a hearing or something. So how can you talk about social distancing and hygiene when that's not what can be possible in in a prison? And so we were calling for resources to put to be put into uh, reentry programs so that the community-based organizations that work with the formerly incarcerated, we need to give them supplemental funding so that they can help make sure that as we are releasing people, number one, as you said, they have some place to go, that they're safe. And, uh, and it's an opportunity, and I mean, I hate to put it this way, but it is an opportunity to see what happens when we do uh, leave people out uh, for bail, like you just said. You know what, 90% of them come back after a reminder. So it's an opportunity to experiment, if you will, with some of the criminal justice reforms we were already looking at. Joaquin, what do you think about that? No, I agree. Uh, you know, we've known for years that in terms of our bail system, there are people in jail who simply can't afford to pay. Uh, and this pandemic has shown the danger uh, of continuing with a system like that. You know, Karen mentioned earlier also uh, ICE detention centers, for example, or the children's detention centers or shelters that HHS runs. Um, folks that are in these cramped quarters like that, just as uh, the sailors who were on the USS Roosevelt and mm -hmm. the, the Americans and others that were on the cruise ships, uh, people that are in those close quarters like that you have to be able to get them out of there and allow them to be in a socially distant place where uh, the virus is not gonna spread right away. And we've seen the spread quickly in other places, um, you know, the outside of prisons. In South Dakota, for example, there's a meat packing plant <laughs> where hundreds of people uh, have come down with the coronavirus. So 
you know, we have to be more attentive to uh, places in our society that we tend to put people in a corner and then ignore them. Uh, we have to attend to those folks right now, especially. Let me ask you this. Is there a, do we know, does Congress know, Eric, does the public health community know uh, what our testing capacity is going to be in one week and two weeks? The reason I'm asking is, it seems to me, if I were a governor today, if I were in Governor Cuomo's position or Governor Newsom's position or uh, the places where it seems to be growing in uh, Michigan or Wisconsin or Illinois, uh, I would want to know how quickly I could assure that if someone agreed to be a contact tracer, they could have safety equipment and they could be tested every day uh, because they'd be going into places where they not only knew somebody had had it, but they could assume that other people were also infected. And in order to do that, you know, first of all, you have to have enough testing equipment so you can test the doctors, the nurses, the other public health workers, the people who are driving the ambulances, all of that. They, they deserve to stay alive and they're risking their lives every day, the first responders and healthcare providers. So how do we know we're gonna have enough testing equipment to do it? And do we know when we'll have it? And then is there any system to prioritize contact tracing once you take care of those people? So Mr. President, I have been um, uh, orchestrating with my colleagues at UCSF a um, a case finding capability that uh, we teed up because we knew it was going to be critical and necessary for any return to normal. And we also knew that uh, our um, ability to do the case finding was directly dependent on our ability to do rapid testing, uh, have results back not in five days a week or longer, but uh, as rapidly as possible, preferably uh, in within uh, hours. Uh, and uh, that uh, began a conversation, speaking just for San Francisco, that required that we talk to the public sector, but also in that mo much of the population is insured and in a third party payment relationship. We, for the first time, had to begin a discussion with large third party payers Kaiser Permanente, et cetera, in San Francisco, and talk about a system that had a closed uh, payment for testing, blood drawing, laboratory, human resources, et cetera, reserved for the people that had their insurance and their packages, matched against a expanding need that covered the entire population of the city. Who had jurisdictions? Were we going to synergize and share? Were we going to make everybody have their own separate lab? Or were we going to be um, ec economical about it? And I can't tell you how difficult that discussion was. Uh, we're talking to profit-driven uh, systems for a healthcare emergency need where uh, the public a charge that you are responsible for the public well-being was not part of their self-perception. But it became part of their self-perception as the discussion proceeded. They realized, we all realized that we had to take that step and corporate thinking had to broaden into the public health need and resources needed to move between. I think we are unique in that we were able to achieve that. Uh, it's a microcosm of what happened at the state and federal level with a lack of a federal focusing on what we're doing, when we're doing it, how we're doing it, to draw a consensus around human needs and commodity needs that really still hasn't occurred to this day. So um, I kind of meandered around there, but I mean, I think I think that's it. <laughs> so what would you all like to say about that? And what can these... Young people who are listening, what could they help you lobby Congress to do to address these things? <laughs> well, I think they could help us lobby Congress to do the testing. 
I mean, it's just inexcusable. And I think what has happened is, is that everything has been put out to the market. And so um, to add to it, something that confounds the whole situation is the promotion of hydroxychloroquine. And uh, I know that they've just, you know, distributed millions of tablets. And so I think refocusing us back on testing, back on public education, back on the contact tracing, I mean, staying focused. The other thing that's terrifying to me right now is you're, you're seeing the beginning of a protest movement. I don't know if you saw what happened in Michigan, where you have yeah. people that were, were protesting the public health protocols. And I noticed as they gathered in those crowds, none of them had their faces covered and they stopped traffic. So there were healthcare workers that couldn't get to the hospital. So I think pushing Congress to continue along the road that we are to provide the resources and to make sure that we get the uh, testing and the treatment and all of that is the best thing that they could help us do right now. And we need the outside help. Uh, and to add what, um, to ki what Karen mentioned, uh, I think there's something that they can help with in the moment now. And then after this pandemic has passed us, this moment has passed us. In terms of the now, what I would add is that there has to be intense pressure on the Congress and our other institutions, both public and private, for honest transparency about what's going on. Yes. We've already seen dangerous examples of deception. For example, yeah. ICE was repeatedly asked how many of its workers and detainees had been infected with the coronavirus, and they repeatedly did not include the numbers from their third party contractors who run mm -hmm. ICE detention centers. So they lowball that number until they were Same. caught. Another example is in my hometown of San Antonio. There were about 67 residents of a nursing home who became infected with the coronavirus. 17 of them ended up dying, but five mm -hmm. of those deaths were not initially disclosed by the nursing home mm -hmm. to the local government. In other words, they were gonna cover up at least five of those deaths and not report them uh, to the government. And so both our public and our private institutions need a lot of pressure right now to make sure that they're being completely honest and transparent. And then one more piece to that, uh, when we move past this moment, as I mentioned earlier and others mentioned, that this has really exposed a lot of the inequities yes. in American society. And I hope that we are closer to believing that health care is a human right that housing is a human right, that everybody should be able to get a good quality education to pursue their American dreams, and that we can move forward as Americans towards that agenda. And you know, since, since the underlying health conditions have been exposed, we do need to get past this crisis, but then after that, let's focus on this, because these health yeah. disparities are not new. And uh, right. now that there's some attention on it though, we need a short term and a long term plan. And doctor, I don't know what you're finding, but one of the things I'm worried about too, is that we don't know the long term consequences of this, the lung damage, the kidney damage, you know? So I don't assume that because somebody has recovered that that means that they're back to normal. No, um, Congresswoman, I think you're right to raise that. I know your nurse practitioner background is coming forward there with <laughs> Uh, an awareness of uh, you see an acute event, but it sets a course for that individual that travels years with them. And uh, I think you're uh, prescient to say that we uh, need to anticipate that what we know of the pathophysiology of this organism, uh, mm -hmm. and as we learn more over the next three or four months, uh, we will understand the multiple organs that the viremia uh, during that initial viremic phase, it lands and does damage. Some of it's permanent. And we need to understand that over time. I think also it was uh, tragic to get people focused on, um, as this epidemic broke, um, to be thrown uh, down a line of, of therapy with the high, you know, the hydroxychloroquine uh, issues, the the, the remdesivir question, uh, the question initially of Kaletra, an antiretroviral for HIV, uh, 
it's always the way these outbreaks happen. People think of therapeutic interventions. Those therapies really would be um, used first for those who are in an extreme. Uh, that would be people who are in ICU level care, most of whom would be intubated. Um, and to see if in the most ill, you're able to change the, the course of that individual. And then it comes back out into less ill uses. Uh, but it was a divergence, I think, that in part pulled us off of the f focus that was needed for the testing uh, to, um, to be implemented uh, aggressively and rapidly. Uh, it put people's uh, attention and resources even followed it uh, because people are that scared and it's completely understandable, but it was a divergence. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I, I just want to emphasize to everybody who's listening to you how profoundly important it is that you get the support you need to get enough testing. Most people still have no idea how many millions and millions of people we need to test at no cost to themselves right. Right. if you want to get this economy going again. And secondly, how much PPE, protective equipment, we need for the people we want to do those tests. And if you want to do contact tracing, you've got to protect the people you want to do it. Mm -hmm. And I still believe that... Uh, we haven't paid enough attention to this. I also, am, one of my personal obsessions is that the states and the cities and even individual hospitals have been left to play the eBay game in terms right. of bidding for public supplies, which I think is a disgrace. We're winding up uh, paying too much for a lot of this and getting too few people supplied quickly enough, and it's costing people lives. And we yeah. should have done it differently. Yeah the way Eric and I worked so hard to do AIDS drugs for so long and uh, yep. the way we try to do TB medicine and, and uh, malarial medicine, lots of other things. We shouldn't be doing this. But uh, I don't think you've got any way to force a different system now. But at least you should be supported in making sure that these healthcare workers you want out there are protected and doing their job. Because every day, people have no idea, the average person the sheer volume we need of masks and protective gear for the people mm -hmm. that are already out there just treating people in hospitals or bringing them to hospitals. But there are all these other people we need to be able to sit out there in the world. That's why I'm thankful that the governors are telling people in working in grocery stores or going in there, they should wear a mask and other things now. Mm -hmm. But we're just at the beginning of this. If we're really right. gonna contact tracing, we are going to need so much more protective gear than people know. And the members of Congress need the support of people who will tell the Congress and tell their government not to fool around with this and not to allow the worsening of these economic and racial disparities when we ought to be using this to set a path that will get rid of them. And I'm very grateful to all of you for doing this. I, um, I don't know if there's any other point you want to make, but we've got six minutes well, left. So if you want to say something else, please say whatever you want. Uh, well, I, I would like to. Uh, I had mentioned uh, earlier that my concern about this emerging, well, what I hope is not an emerging, but this protest movement of people saying we need to open up our economy and we need to go out. People who are listening to this need to counter that as well. It needs to be driven by science and not by politics. And if we push and people are gonna openly object to the uh, public health guidelines, there needs to be a very loud voice countering that. Otherwise, I don't know how the curve is gonna be flattened. Uh, it's gonna, we're just going to have a whole nother spike <laughs> if this is the direction that a lot of people are gonna take. Well, and I would add to that, that oh, go ahead, Mr. President, sorry. I just was gonna say, uh, Color me skeptical. I don't think they happen by accident, and I don't think right. they happen. Right, absolutely. Somebody put them up to it, and they ought to stop it, and it needs to be uncovered and called out. I think it's Go a ahead, TV Mark. network, but okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, as Karen mentioned, this uh, 
protest movement that's growing. And a lot of that anxiety, uh, I believe that a lot of it is being ginned up uh, by one particular group of folks. But a lot of it also is um, based on the fact that people are now out of work and they're wondering how mm -hmm. they're going to pay their bills. And so I know our session has been mostly about the health part, uh, but making sure that we're healthy, uh, to make sure that we're healthy, we also have to make sure that the government is delivering uh, relief economically to people so they feel that they're in a better position where they don't have to go take chances out in the world when there's a pandemic going on. And uh, I can speak to my home state of Texas where the delivery method uh, for getting unemployment benefits to folks, for example, uh, has been quite poor, unfortunately. A woman told me the other day that she called the Texas Workforce Commission 103 times before she was able to finally get through. Uh, and mm -hmm. so I think some of that anxiety is people feeling as though they're going to drown in debt or face the prospect of eviction or otherwise need to go out into the world to make money. Uh, and so the government has to do a better job than what it's done so far in offering people economic relief as well. Well, I agree with that. I think, first of all, if you look at the early surveys, when Americans were asked, what are you going to do with the check you get? Almost all of them said, I'm going to buy food, mm. which means right. they need mortgage right. or rent. You cannot, we can't have people being thrown out of their homes because of this. Since we know that sooner or later there'd be a massive public uh, uprising, we should take care of it before they're thrown out. That's right. Because the money they've gotten is too little to do anything but feed themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. Uh, and I appreciate you saying that. I also believe that look at the price we paid for ignoring the early warning system. Mm -hmm. we, we we paid a terrible price for the delay in starting dealing with all this, and that makes it more costly to do now. But you're right. The working people are obviously worried about having enough money. Most people, before this happened, half the people right. in the country said they would have a very difficult time dealing with something that cost more than $400 that was unanticipated. So... We got to protect their basic human needs, and that's got to be. If there's going to be another bill, uh, we have to face the rent and mortgage implications of what they're facing. But they need to understand that we can go back to work more quickly if we do it under conditions when you're not going to have to turn around and just impose another shutdown 10 days afterward because thousands of more people die. They don't want that either. So I'm glad you said that. We should all be sensitive to what people who don't have any cushion feel. Mm -hmm. But we won't help them if mm -hmm. we put them in the harm's way where they can lose their lives or they cost someone else theirs. We don't want to do that. Eric, you want to say anything before we go? Well, thank you, Mr. President, um, uh, and thank you both to both of you for your, your I think, really uh, – um, insightful comments. Uh, I believe that um, we are at a crisis for the African American and Hispanic communities that is wrapped in this pandemic. Uh, it mm -hmm. is it, or it is in, up to individuals like yourselves who can connect the dots. But I hope this puts a surge of commitment, interest, and urgency in the country to deal with these issues of disparity around health care, understand the connection to the economy and our, our all uh, country's ability to rise up as a nation. We cannot have um, inequities in access and performance that, that we continue to allow. And I believe the government needs to be much more aggressive in defining, understanding, quantitating, and addressing these disparities uh, uh, across the board, from health to education to housing, uh, uh, it, homeless, uh, prison populations. Uh, we can talk about disparities in all of those arenas. So thanks for this opportunity, and I look forward to trying to think of ways to this, uh, for this to take
uh, on momentum and get legs. I want to ask you to watch closely what they try to do in Congress and try to give your support to it. There are things we can do that will reduce the death rate by race and by income. But the truth is, we need universal access to health care. The Medicaid expansion will get us to 97% or so if we can get every state to adopt it. And we need actual care for people who are out there being our first responders and healthcare workers. And they're disproportionately in New York, for example, members of the Latino and African-American communities, along with a lot of Asians and others who are first-generation immigrants keeping us safe. This is something we have to deal with together. And we have to recognize that this is horrible in its own right, but it also has laid bare the fact that we don't have a public health network in every community in America that is adequate to this. And we, again, I will say we have got to replenish the stockpile until we get massive amounts of protective equipment and the other things like the ventilators we need in the event this happens again. But we have a lot of work to do right now. And right now we don't have a test or protective equipment to do it. If we can do it, we can begin to go back to work and we can begin to get rid of the disparity in deaths. Thank you. I'm Katrina Velasquez-Neros, and the future is fighting for human rights. The future is fighting the opioid epidemic. The future is fighting climate change. And protecting natural resources. Tackling domestic violence. It's empowering refugee women. Zero discrimination and equal job opportunities for everyone. It's equitable access to education. Tackling substance abuse. The disaster resilient world. The future is empowering the next generation of leaders. Hello to you all, wherever you are in the world. Thanks to each and every one of you for joining us today for our first ever CGIU virtual event. My name is Maisha Alexander, and I'm the CGIU Impact and Design Manager currently based here in Brooklyn, New York. I'm also a proud member of the CGIU alumni community class of 2010 and 2011, and a former CGIU commitment mentor. The CGIU team is so incredibly excited and grateful that as we face these globally challenging times, we're still able to find a way to come together with experts and all of you for meaningful and important conversations. While we're very disappointed that we didn't have an opportunity to meet many of you in person, we have been so heartened to watch the community mobilize in support of each other and our CGIU staff. It's been with the help of many people across our CGIU community that we've been able to put this event together and bring a new and exciting added dimension to the CGIU experience. Back in March, CGIU 2020 students were challenged to submit a short self-recorded video telling us about themselves, their commitment to action, and their reflections on how the novel coronavirus has affected them and their community. Students were also invited to submit questions on any topic for President Clinton and Chelsea Clinton. During this next program segment, you'll have an opportunity to meet several members of the CGIU 2020 cohort, listen to their questions, and hear directly from President Clinton and Chelsea with their responses. We're deeply appreciative of the students who took time out to put together their video submissions. So without further ado, welcome to CGIU's first virtual town hall with President Bill Clinton and Chelsea Clinton. Hi, I'm Maya Yakia. I live in the Netherlands and I'm representing the Free University of Amsterdam. My one question to President Bill Clinton or Chelsea Clinton is, the COVID-19 pandemic is changing our life. So how can we come out of it while also strengthening our democratic institutions worldwide? Well, first of all, my, I think that's a really good question. Uh, my advice, first of all, is to make sure that the kind of good information we've gotten continues when the COVID emergency passes. 
Uh, I think, by and large, all across the world, the press has done a very good job in educating people about the dimensions of the crisis and the impact it's having in the particular area they're reporting. I think uh, most attempts at fake news have failed, and we have to keep fighting for that. I think we have learned here the consequences in stark terms of not having good information. Secondly, uh, I think every country should examine its voting procedures and see whether they have done everything possible to make them effective, honest, checkable, and uh, something that will work even when people are homebound. I think that's very important. We just had an unfortunate situation in the United States in a race in Wisconsin where the Supreme Court basically said that the election had to occur on the day it was settled. And thank goodness a large number of people voted in advance, but we don't need to be putting lives at risk to be good citizens. So I think making sure the machinery works and keeping the information flow good and as accurate as possible, I think are very important. Then I believe that the sense that many people must have felt all over the world that they were helpless and voiceless should be overcome. We need more people active in more elections on a regular basis and realizing that some of these elections will have far greater consequences than we can imagine if anything bad happens. And I hope that this has made everybody listening here from whatever country aware that there are enormous consequences to elections and it's very important to get it right. So Maya, I think that's such an important question. And I would just add to what my dad said that uh, I think what has become uh, really evident is why investments in public health are important to helping protect our democracy as well as helping to protect um, public health broadly and, and patient health specifically. Uh, so I would hope that and if part of our response becomes part of our resilience um, moving forward, including the resilience of our democracy, that we desperately need to be making more investments in efforts like contact tracing, um, desperately need to be making more investments in efforts to ensure that people who are suspected of um, having COVID-19 or who have tested positive for COVID-19 can isolate in, in dignity and with kind of the support um, that they need while doing so. So I hope that kind of as we kind of navigate through um, this horrible moment, um, we are able to take what we are learning uh, now and kind of just embed that in what we expect out of our, our leadership moving forward, our leadership at the uh, local level, at the national level, and also at the global level. My name is Joseph Paul Javier, and I'm a doctor of pharmacy student here at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. Now, as the CARES Act has been signed to support critical efforts at a whopping cost of $2.3 trillion, how can the government ensure that the United States will have the resources to better respond in the future to a crisis like the coronavirus pandemic? First, that's a very good question. <laughs> and uh, I think it's important that you understand that there are people in the Congress and in the country among the governors and the mayors and other officials who want to do that. Um, my first piece of advice is that we should more adequately fund our stockpile. I signed legislation to set that stockpile up way back in 1998. It needs to be properly maintained for this sort of thing. We should have had uh, more ventilators. We should have had a lot more PPE, we should have had a lot more everything. We need those things in the stockpile. Other countries do as well. Secondly, I think we need a much better coordination among nations of the world if we don't want this to happen again. Uh, I prefer working with the WHO than fighting with it just because I think we need to be able to see everybody who's affected with this at first respond the way South Korea did, for example. If so, we'll have fewer people die, we'll have lower costs, and we'll have more people working right through. But you have to be prepared for this. We need to game it out. We need to continue to work on it. I think it should be part of our national security planning, as well as our economic planning. 
And uh, if it happens again, I think we'll be in a position, if we have adequate testing and if we have adequate supplies, to respond much, much more quickly in a way that requires much less drastic economic actions. But it's important to be prepared. And if we invest a little along now, then the next time it happens, in all probability, we'll be able to respond much more quickly. And Joseph, I would just add that I think um, while we absolutely need to be um, doing everything we can to support people today, we also uh, need to recognize uh, the fault lines that this crisis has exposed in our country, um, the kind of structural inequalities, the kind of deep um, kind of festering wound of uh, racism in our country, um, as well as the fact that we have underinvested in not only supporting our health workforce in the way that my dad spoke about with kind of not having adequate uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, masks, gowns, face shields, um, but also that we haven't invested enough ensuring that our health workforce, our doctors, our nurses, our respiratory technicians, our hospital administrators, our hospital cleaning staff, our hospital um, kind of food support staff, that they are uh, both protected but also respected in how much um, we're paying them to do their uh, clearly essential jobs, um, but also that we are helping to train the next generation of um, everyone who who will do those jobs in the uh, in the time ahead, um, because we don't have enough frontline health staff across the board, and um, we need to ensure that we have enough frontline health staff for uh, kind of the next time this happens, and that could be you know in a year or two or kind of further down the pike, but also. Um, so that we are just more robustly prepared for the future, whatever it may bring, and hopefully um, are learning the painful lessons of this moment to have a more kind of equitable um, future full of kind of greater uh, dignity and respect and that we're uh, reflecting our values, especially kind of for our frontline health workers in doing that. My name is Winter Wilson. I am from Athens, Ohio in the United States, and I study at Ohio University. So if I could ask Bill and Chelsea Clinton one question, it would be, uh, what have been your biggest lessons learned and takeaways from your response within the Clinton Foundation to COVID-19? Well, first of all, I'm very grateful for the response that the foundations had and our affiliates. Uh, my takeaways are one, I wish we could have been done, been able to do more, but at least we were able to do some very important things, including uh, feeding tens of tens of thousands of meals to people where our, my presidential library is in a system that allowed us to prepare and package the meals and then leave them outside the door and have them distributed in a safe and healthy way to people who otherwise wouldn't have had enough food to eat from poor kids and their families, to the homeless, to other vulnerable populations. Uh, the work that Too Small to Fail did, trying to help parents who don't have kids in preschool or uh, didn't have other schooling options so that they could continue to work on educating and stimulating their kids and maintain a sense of normalcy in the home. I think that's important. Uh, I think the work that uh, the people in the Clinton Health Access Initiative did in working with the World uh, Health Organization and trying to prepare them to help other countries. It's important because if we don't do that, then these problems not only will unfairly hurt the poorest people on earth, but also come back into America. And then there are other things that we, our opioid work with faith groups transformed into faith groups that wanted to know what to tell their parishioners about how to handle this and how to be responsible about it. You know, we've seen a lot of press about people having worship services when they shouldn't have. We haven't seen enough press, I think, on the people who have been over backwards to follow the public health guidelines and protect the people in their care. So I think we have done what we could. Uh, as I said, I wish we could have done more, but we did as much as we could, I think, under the circumstances. And in the days and weeks ahead, I hope we'll be able to do more. 
Hi guys, my name is Liz Catterall. I study international law and international relations here at the University of Edinburgh. My question to Bill and Chelsea Clinton would be how do we tackle these mental health crises and how do we deliver the support that people need whilst also ensuring that people are following the guidelines and staying inside? Well, Liz, I think, first of all, that's a really important question because we know that for a lot of people, the pressures that they feel will be aggravated by the sense of isolation. I think it's important uh, to develop a lot of instruction for people who are neighbors and friends and relatives of people who have mental health issues about what they can do to support the professionals. Then I think we need to uh, get as much of this service directly online as possible. And we have to have a small cadre of people who are equipped to safely go to the homes of people who have severe problems, who may not be responding online or may not be able to respond online. Uh, and I think that we can't forget that the physical challenges can be as grave as the mental ones, but we don't want to put the people's lives at risk who are in a position to help. So in some, that, that's what I think we need to build systems for systems that at least we in the United States didn't have inadequate supply. And I would just say, Elizabeth, that I think um, we all can check on our friends and our family. Um, here in the United States, there's been an extraordinary effort um, for young people especially to kind of help their older uh, family members, their older neighbors, and increasingly being connected to um, older people who they don't know and, and will never meet except possibly kind of through waving through a window to be able to go pick up groceries, to be able to go um, pick up uh, prescriptions at, at pharmacies. And I think um, hopefully that sense of, of community, even in this moment of uh, kind of being uh, apart, but finding ways to be together, hopefully will be good for all of us, for those who are engaged kind of in that, in that work of, of reaching out and helping and kind of being engaged and also kind of for people to hopefully not feel as alone, whether they're kind of at the other end of a phone call or a grocery drop off. Uh, and I think too, one of the things that is really encouraging, uh, at least here in the United States, is that um, various uh, mental health professional associations, practices and efforts are um, racing to figure out how to augment their already pre-existing kind of telehealth uh, recommendations, rules, programs, options, um, and and to do kind of real-time research and monitoring for kind of what what is working, what is resonating, and also what isn't working and isn't resonating to be able to course correct uh, real time. So I think it's incredibly encouraging that uh, so much is happening, and yet we know so much more needs to happen. Um, and we also know, at least here in the U.S., we had still an enormous amount of stigma around kind of people raising their hands and saying, you know, I need help um, and kind of insufficient resources for even those who were kind of raising their hands and saying, I need help. So hopefully kind of as we move through this m moment, we'll continue to obliterate stigma and continue to build capacity and competency so that um, everyone who needs help for any reason, whether that's kind of in one moment or for a lifetime is able to get the help they need. If, if I could just say one last thing, I, one of the things that I've learned from this is how many people needed protective equipment that I hadn't thought of when it started. And I think it must be true in Edinburgh where you're in school and it must be true in every country represented here. But they're the first responders in New York where Chelsea and I live. The number of them whose lives have been put on the line because they had to respond to situations, whether they're police officers or ambulance drivers or whatever, that they weren't prepared for is staggering. And a lot of them have gotten sick. And I think this just hammers home the fact that when this is over, we need to basically prepare for this who's going to do what, where, and we need to make sure that everybody's got the reserve of protective equipment they need to give people the ability to deliver 
in-person mental health interventions if necessary, as well as to do whatever we can online. Well, and, and I would just say too, um, we also here in the United States and in Scotland and everywhere um, need to be thinking now about what um, we need to ensure that we're able to provide um, you know, at no cost, seamlessly, kind of at high quality as supportive services to all of our frontline workers who um, are often being sent kind of uh, into, um, into work, whether that's kind of into a hospital, on an ambulance, on a fire truck, kind of in a grocery store, at a pharmacy, um, with insufficient um, protective equipment, and certainly over the last kind of weeks and even months with kind of insufficient information. Um, and we owe an enormous, incalculable um, debt of, of gratitude and, and solidarity to everyone who's been on the front lines. And we need to ensure that we're um, helping protect uh, kind of their mental health uh, today and over the, over the time ahead. Hello everyone, I'm Carrie from Hong Kong. I'm currently a final year student in Ningnan University. Regarding a question to ask President Clinton, well, we all know there has been so many, many issues that we have to make effort to tackle. But when thousands of issues come across together, how will you prioritize those issues or choose to deal with some of them first? How would you make it? Well, Carrie, I think there are as many right answers to that question as there are kind of people listening. Uh, to us today, um, or as arguably as there are people in the world. I think we have to, each of us, think about how do we kind of match what we kind of care most intensely about with with our talents, and then hopefully kind of use that kind of intensity of feeling, whether that is anger about kind of something that we think has gone wrong, or kind of hope for something that is going right, and kind of where we think we can make a difference, and then hopefully use that to prioritize where we spend our time and energy uh, and then kind of think more broadly about kind of what do we want to see more of in the world or, or less than and then use that to help us prioritize kind of what other organizations we may want to get involved in, kind of what, what work do we want to support, uh, what candidates do we want to vote for, um, and kind of just think about kind of how we prioritize um, in a way that hopefully feels um, empowering and, and good for us, and also hopefully kind of helps create an impact in the world. That's a question I ask myself all the time, partly because I'm so much older than everybody who's at CGIU, but also because uh, one of my strengths and weaknesses is I'm interested in everything. And I always want to do something about everything I can. What I try to do is ask myself, first of all, is this challenge something I can do something about? Do I know enough about it or can I get enough partners to help? Uh, can I finance a meaningful response or can I do something that will be a model that then I can turn over to other people? And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. For example, I'm very proud of the work we've done with small farmers in Africa, but I don't have enough money to do it for millions of farmers. And there's, it's unlike healthcare, uh, the development of small farming has not been amplified as it should. And so it's frustrating to me because I'm loath to give it up, but I know that it, with the limited funding I have, it might be better to put it into something else. So there, are, there really are difficult questions that have to be answered here that aren't always easy to answer. Um, I also have to face the fact that the political climate in America is slightly different than it used to be. And, uh, well, that's obvious. So that has affected, I think, the range of things I can do. I have been, however, richly blessed to stay busy. And uh, I, we do especially a lot of work in our region, in the Caribbean and Latin America, uh, I have still a working group in Haiti that's been working now for more than a decade. We've raised well over $500 million to invest in Haiti, and we're still doing things through political ups and downs and all kinds of upheavals. We work in the 
areas of the Caribbean that are particularly vulnerable to hurricanes. Uh, they have, in the case of the Bahamas, have also suffered an earthquake. And we try to get people together and work together in a way that both strengthens disaster response, but all going, ongoing governmental processes, something we need to do in the aftermath of the COVID-19. So I try to do something that I care about, I know is important, and I believe I can have an impact. Uh, I'm not particularly uh, interested in doing things where I think I can just give a speech but can't really have an impact. So I think all of you need to think about that. If you're younger, advocacy is important and standing up and being heard is important. But at my age, I think I should put most of my energies into doing things that will actually have an immediate impact on people's lives in a positive fashion. And that's what I try to do. Hello everyone, my name is Veronika Bandarovic. I am from Belarus. I study at the University of Edinburgh. If I had the opportunity to ask President Bill Clinton one question, it would be the following. How do you help yourself in times of hardships? Well, that's a good question. For me, I'm lucky. I have a, a wonderful, brilliant, wife I can talk to. I have, as you just saw, a special daughter and and a son-in-law. I can ask for advice. or And I have a wonderful group of close friends. Uh, and I've been blessed in that because one of the things that happens as you get older is you have to say goodbye to more and more people who are really, really important in your life. But I still have a group of friends that I rely on, that I'm in regular contact with. And if I'm feeling low or feeling perplexed, I can tell them without thinking I look weak or foolish or worrying about reading something embarrassing in the press about it. I just say it. Uh, I also have certain sort of wisdom books that I refer to from time to time. I go back every couple of years and read the Meditations of Mark Aurelius. I read Thomas Akempis' Imitation of Christ. I read uh, The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz, a Toltec uh, shaman and a doctor. I read things that I think make sense that help me kind of get reoriented. And uh, I think all of us need that. But I also try to wake up every day reminding myself of what a blessed life I've had and and that I still have my health and my brain still works pretty well and I need to get up and get the show on the road and not worry about the obstacles, just go do what I can. And it should be like that for all of us, I think. Particularly those of you who are younger, you have no earthly idea what all is going to happen to you, good and bad, and uh, in your life. And you have to embrace your dreams and know who you are and then accept the victories with a grain of salt and the defeats with a grain of salt and just do the best you can. And one thing I find helpful is reminding myself every day about how I keep score. How you keep score in your life is really important. If you have a financial setback, your friends will still be there for you. If you have a work setback and you still got your ability, your brain and your heart, you can start again. If you make a mistake, you can own it and go again. Uh, this is for Christians, the season of Easter. It's a, I used to joke with people, but not joking, that I might have found myself to my faith, even if I hadn't been born a Christian, because uh, we believe in a God of second chances. And in all major faith, in some way or another, that's acknowledged. I saw it uh, in Passover because my son-in-law is Jewish. I have a lot of Muslim friends. I have friends who are Hindus. Uh, one of my friends regularly sends me wonderful poetry now, a century old, from Rabindranath Tagore, the great Indian poet and philosopher. 
So I think that you should draw on old, all these things. And you just got to remember life is a gift. And it doesn't take long to live a life. So you might as well enjoy every day you have and take the tough days as a learning experience and go on. I'm Talia Bales. How can we at Young People continue supporting our communities and lifting up their voices to make sure they're heard during this global pandemic? Well, I think that's one place where the social media has been a real blessing. Uh, you know, I'm sure that like all of you, I have been profoundly moved by social media messaging, which has reached me from all around the country and from it's far away from South Africa as, and, uh, and Asian countries, people getting their messages out. Here's what's going on. Here's what we need. Here's what we're trying to do. I think that that's the best thing that young people can do. Uh, you can help people of all ages and different conditions who have something that others need to hear make sure it gets to the right people and to the public at large. And I think that the traditional news media has also done a pretty good job of scouring the social media, trying to find things not only that will keep us laughing, although there's been an abundance of that, and that's been one of the uh, unforeseen benefits of this otherwise terrible plague we've been dealing with. But I think that the, that we're all a little more sensitive than we once were uh, to how much the rampant uh, inequality in our society extends to people's sense of isolation and not being heard. Uh, for, I'll just give you an example. There's a, we just assume that this is an urban disease, or we did for a while now, beginning to hit rural areas in America. And there are a lot of people there who say, look, there's just one or two people or one or two businesses in this town. If they're gone, they're gone. The whole town will die. We need to know about those places. We need to have a whole strategy for dealing with places that are uh, like the children we tried to help, too small to be left behind. And I think that these are the kinds of things that young people are especially adept at bringing to the attention of the larger public. You know, I think that not only do we have a responsibility to um, really listen to one another right now here in the United States and around the world, um, we also have a responsibility to learn from one another and learn with one another, um, whether that is kind of on the science side of trying to understand this um, horrific disease that um, we still know so little about, um, to how do we really uh, stay connected uh, in our in our families, in our in our friend groups, kind of in our broader communities, um, even while we while we stay apart? Um, and I certainly think um, we have a responsibility to listen to, um, especially the very young youngest among us. I mean, I know as a parent, I'm kind of really listening to my children, uh, not the baby; he's only eight and a half months old, but to my three and five year old. Um, because they're in a period of real uncertainty. I mean, we've not kind of been in school now for a, more than a month. Like they haven't seen their friends in more than a month. I think we're at six weeks now. And so, you know, really ensuring that we are listening to each other, um, kind of leading with, with compassion and kindness and empathy, um, especially for our youngest um, among us, but also uh, really for for everyone everywhere, because I think the only way we're going to be able to continue to kind of move through this moment is uh, to be um, as as flexible and nimble as, as possible and to be learning whatever we can. And we're only gonna be able to do that if we continue to um, reach out and, and listen uh, to what people in our kind of closest families and communities can tell us, but also kind of what is really working uh, for people across our city, across our country and across the world. Thanks again for joining us at this special meeting focused on COVID-19 and how our response to it can make us all stronger, better prepared, more resilient, and more likely to keep ourselves, our loved ones, and our neighbors healthy. I want to thank CGIU's partners before I go. 
and they make our year-round work possible, and they played an important role in our efforts to adapt and address to the new challenges we're facing now. Building on the success of our partnership with IBM last year, we're excited to launch a dedicated university edition of the 2020 call, excuse me, the 2020 call for code global challenge. It's a worldwide initiative that is inspiring developers, problem solvers, and innovators across all disciplines to tackle both the pandemic and climate change. We also look forward to continuing our work with the Pete Peterson Foundation and its Up to Us program to build a sustainable economic and fiscal future for America's next generation, a topic made even more urgent by the corona pandemic and its continued impact and uncertain future impact on our economy. And I'd like to give a special acknowledgement to my friend Kevin Shu, a longtime supporter of our work. Kevin is serving as founding partner of the new CGIU COVID-19 Student Action Fund. It'll provide seed funding to select students who are working to address the pandemic. This is really important. You know, when you have good ideas, uh, you at least need a little startup funds, just like you will if you start your own business. So thanks, Kevin, for doing that. I also want to thank the CGI University Network, 60 member schools from nine countries who support, mentor, and provide funding to CGIU students at their respective institutions. And we're also asking them to work closely with us on this action project. I want to thank Vice Chancellor Peter Matheson and the University of Edinburgh community for their engagement in CGIU this past year as a host and partner. As I mentioned earlier, though we had to cancel the CGIU 2020 meeting, the University of Edinburgh has been glad and generous to welcome us back in 2021. So from April 9th through 11th next year, we'll be in Edinburgh. And I hope that all of you who couldn't come this year can join us. I'd also like to thank my longtime friend and former partner in Africa, Tom Hunter and the Hunter Foundation for their generous ongoing support as a presenting sponsor of our very first international CGIU meeting. Finally, to all of you in the CGIU 2020 class, our commitment mentors, our entire alumni network, thank you for your extraordinary engagement and for hanging in there during this challenging time. I'm inspired as always by your creativity and your commitment and the support you show for your communities and to one another. I look forward to all the good you'll do in helping us act on what came out of this meeting and getting ready for next year. Keep your spirits up. As we work toward the end of the pandemic, May we all grow in strength, knowledge, wisdom, and heart.